Well, hey, 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 it's me, Leo Laporte, with Mike as Sergeant. Time for Ask the Tech Guys. Dick T. Bartolo's coming up with not one, but two crazy gadgets and a way to win a mad magazine. Ooh, and I am Mike as Sergeant, and we talk to a listener who has a question What service should I use to set up a one page website? And then we get a really interesting question How much does your ISP know about what you're doing on the internet? It's all coming up next on Ask the Tech Guys. This episode is brought to you by Zscaler, the leader in cloud security. Cyber attackers are now using AI in creative ways to compromise users and breach organizations. In a security landscape where you must fight AI with AI, the best AI protection comes from having the best data. Zscaler has extended its zero-trust architecture with powerful AI engines that are trained and tuned by 500 trillion daily signals. Learn more about Zscaler Zero Trust plus AI to prevent ransomware and AI attacks. Experience your world secured. Visit zscaler.com slash zero trust AI. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Ask the Tech Guys with Micah Sargent and Leo Laporte. Episode 2017, recorded Sunday, March 24th, 2024. 18 tons of wax. Ask the Tech Guys is brought to you by my email provider, Fastmail, a leader in email privacy for more than 20 years. Make email better with Fastmail. And one of the reasons I love Fastmail, they use open internet standards, the Cyrus server, and they're moving email forward by supporting the Cyrus server and new internet standards and open source innovations. A lot of other email services use it, but Fastmail originates it. And you're going to love Fastmail. You can use it in any of your email programs, but they also have great iOS and Android apps and their webmail is second to none. With quick settings, you can choose themes, you can switch between light and dark modes, change text size, generate masked email addresses, autosave contacts, set default reminders, and more. It's powerful. You can even now add a domain name to Fastmail or even buy it from Fastmail so that you can use your own domain name as your email. They'll set up all the records for you. You pay for free email with your privacy. You may be using a free email client right now, but I, I got to tell you, if you're a business or even an individual and you care about email, it's worth as little as $3 a month to use Fastmail. Your data stays yours. Of course, there's never any ads. There's better spam filters, so there's even fewer ads in your email. Download your old email, put it in Fastmail, and you'll be ready to go. Or have Fastmail continue to collect your email from your old email address. It is the best way to do email. And it works with password managers like our sponsor, Bitwarden, or 1Password to generate masked email addresses that are unique to each account. They still come into your inbox, but no one knows it's you. It's great for privacy. Download the Fastmail app, put it on iOS or Android, use their web interface, or use your own email software. Either way, Fastmail is the best. I've been using it for more than a decade now. The better email service. That quality is worth a few bucks a month. If you care about email, why are you using free email? Make your email better with Fastmail now. Free for 30 days. Fastmail.com slash twit. That's Fastmail.com slash twit. Well, hey, hey, hey. Thank you, Micah Sargent, for filling in last week. I'm Leo Laporte. I'm back. You're back, baby. Rested, ready to answer your questions. And full of vitamin D. Full of vitamin... You, am I a little darker? You're a little darker, yeah. Yeah. I'm actually darker than you now. <laughs> Not quite. Almost. It's 888. Getting there. <laughs> 72... I could have been. Yeah, I, I bet told you Lisa could've. I want to come back darker Not a good idea, my, though. 888... <laughs> no, bad. 888-724-2884 is the phone number. Yes. You can call that during the show to be brought up and to be able to ask a question. If you call during the week, though, you can leave a voicemail. And then that voicemail can be played back during the show. There are a few other ways to get in touch with us as well. Uh, there's an email, atg at twit.tv. When you send in text, it goes behind Leo. And yes, we've got a nice stack of emails ready for you. Uh, but we also will accept video and audio 
sent to that address as well, uh, which can be played back during the show. And then the other way to get in touch is by heading to call.twit.tv on your browser, on your phone or your computer, wherever you want to do it, uh, to be able to join us in the Zoom room. You will hang out in the Zoom room waiting uh, to ask your question. That the Zoom room. Not the Zoom room. A, the Zoom the, room. Yes, this is Did true. Did you get the email? No, I didn't. Okay, wait. Never. Oh, wait. Is it the the? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I had a, a person who, who who taught me about broadcast journalism who was very much a stickler on stickler, excuse me, on the versus the. But anyway, um, <laughs> when you join the Zoom room, the Zoom room, uh, you will need to look toward the bottom of your screen where you will find a raise hand button. Uh, tapping or clicking on that button lets us know that you have a question. That you've raised your hand. And that means that you've raised your hand. Yeah. Uh, that is is how you get brought up onto the stage where you will be able to ask your question. Yes. That's all good and well. Mm -hmm. But we'd like to ask one more thing. We get a lot of repeat callers. And I know for those of you trying to get in, that's frustrating. So we want to just today, we, let's let's get all new callers. First time, long time kind of people. Okay? Absolutely. Uh, so we want to make sure that way everybody gets a chance to get in. Did anything happen while I was gone? Uh, many things. A, f a few things. Yeah. You know what didn't happen? Apple did not release new iPads. No, they Thought did not. Thought that would happen. Yeah, there was a chance. Department of Justice did sue <laughs> yes, Apple. That uh, did happen. Wow. That's a big lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's t 85 pages. Uh, I spent uh, the uh, weekend reading. Oh, no work. No work. I worked. Uh, we all did because we want to kind of figure out, well, what is the DOJ upset with? And and mostly I thought, I'm going to have to have an opinion on this. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You need to come back and, and pretty I don't much really have an opinion. hit the ground running. Stephen Sanofsky wrote a great piece. He said, there's going to be two kinds of people. There's going to be people, people who believe that the government should, should keep uh, companies from getting too big, too powerful, who will be very happy that the Department of Justice has actually pursued an antitrust, Sherman antitrust violation lawsuit against Apple, then there will be the Apple fans who say, but what's wrong with Apple? I'm very happy. Apple isn't making me buy an iPhone. I love my iPhone. And so these are, you know, the people who either will say, well, the government shouldn't get involved because they don't know technology or they're just happy Apple users. Um, and I'm kind of in both camps. Yeah. I don't, I think the government should weigh in when these companies get too big and it's, Frankly, I th I'm more worried about Google. I think, you know, I'd like to see much more uh, control of Google because they're so powerful by controlling the search right. space that that really makes them the most powerful company in tech. But all right, you know, the government can do more than it can walk and chew gum. So they're going <laughs> to they're going to pursue Google, I'm sure. Uh, and they have to some degree. But this one is a big one against Apple. And there's a real question. Is Apple even a monopoly? That is, yeah, that's a conversation that I continue to see being brought up. And that is where I find myself in, in two camps, right? It's, it's <laughs> an ongoing kind of conversation about what exactly, where, where is Apple's place in all of this? And how, what what can what is considered a monopoly in this new way that the government is looking well, at? Well, that's tech. the problem because they they had to Apple's monop quote monopoly in smartphone sales in the U.S. is 50, 60 percent. That's not a monopoly, buddy. Right. Buddy, <laughs> uh, you know it's almost half and half. Uh, but they say in this new category they've invented, which is like premium smartphones, they're seventy percent. Still not a monopoly, buddy. <laughs> uh, and I think you can really make a strong case that nobody's forced to buy Apple. Now, there is a case to be made that Apple, by pursuing its walled garden strategy... Once you're in... Makes it hard for mm -hmm. you to go to leave, but or even more importantly, makes it hard for others to participate. So they had a strong case, for instance, about the Apple Watch uh, not working on Android. Apple said, by the way, Apple was ready. Apple was prepared. They had responses galore. And one of them was, no, we worked for three years to make the Apple Watch work on Android. We just never could. Yeah. We could never get it working. Uh, whether you believe that or not, it is the case that Apple has a walled garden, that once you're in it, and many of us, and I think you and I are included in this, are happy in our walled garden. Oh, yeah. Somewhat. Yeah. I mean, because the things that it provides that genuinely, if I look at any other company 
that is more open, less walled garden can't make the same promises, or if they try to make the same promises, can't hold up to them. The 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 interoperability that I have among my devices truly is unique to Apple, as far as I'm concerned. And so in that way, I am happy with that. But at the same time, I have found myself wanting some of the stuff that the EU has made possible because of the DMA, right? That has actually some of the, the forced changes for Apple there. I think some of them are good and it'd be nice to be able to pick and choose. Uh, but I know I can't have my cake and I'm eat a, it too. I'm a fan of open, right? You know, yeah. I like, I prefer open systems to proprietary systems, but there are benefits that you gain from proprietary systems. And here's the real problem that DOJ is going to face. Apple customers choose Apple because they like those benefits and they don't really feel disadvantaged that they are, you know, can't message Android people. You know, that the green bubble issue doesn't bother iPhone users. Yeah. And I don't even think it bothers that many Android users, to be honest with you. Especially outside of the U.S. Nobody outside of the U.S. really cares about it at and all. And if you do care, you can use WhatsApp in the U.S. or many other choices, which will solve all of those problems. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be an uphill case. Although, you know, here's an article in The Verge that says... It's even stronger than imagined. Antitrust suit, they talk to a bunch of experts. They say, it, even though it's an uphill battle, it's a strong start. How much, so I, I talked to um, Jennifer Patterson Tui of The Verge about this. Uh, it had just broke on Thursday morning or it had gone official on Thursday morning. Right. And she and I were discussing the difference between this and back when Microsoft was facing the same issue. And at the time, I, I kind of, uh, tried to, I guess, not compare, but contrast the two. At the time, the people who were concerned with it, when it came to Microsoft, it was the company itself. And then if we think about it as a circle, the core was the company itself that was concerned about it. And then outside of that core was a larger group that were the businesses that all used Microsoft technologies, like the software. And that was pretty much it. The government and those those parts of the circle. But now, because of the interconnectivity of all of us and the way that all of this kind of spreads, I feel like there is a larger group that has more concern about it. Even if we look at the core, which is Apple, and then, haha, that's a pun there, uh, right outside of the core, which would be uh, the businesses and the, you know, the, the, the technology that's involved there. But then we increase the circle even more us, these sort of pro-consumers slash journalists slash bloggers, even if it's just that group, it's still a much larger group of people that have more concern this time. And so I wonder how much of what's happening here will be shaped by public opinion, whereas I don't know if there was as much as many people shouting about and caring about what was happening with Microsoft at the time. And so if you didn't have any kind of public opinion, having any role at the time, it really did just come down to what the government felt and could prove and what the company felt and could prove. But this time it feels like you have back to back to back, you know, Spotify complains about what Apple is doing. Then Spotify tells its customers how it feels about it. You have Epic games complaining about what Apple's doing, but then Epic tells its customers about what it, and you get these kind of uh, larger armies that are helping to push that may play that role. So maybe when it comes to what uh, the Verge's experts that they quoted are talking about here, you know, that it's a stronger case, how much of it is actually a stronger case and how much of it is that public opinion is not on big tech's side like it may be yeah, wasn't I mean, in, you know, didn't play a role before. That's one of the things Steven Sanofsky said, which I disagree with, is that this is a political prosecution. And I, I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think that the, I think it's important for both the FTC and the Department of Justice to pursue antitrust. To if do their jobs. If yeah. yeah, to do their jobs. If there's one flaw in capitalism is that when a company becomes big enough to assert a monopoly in one market, it can use that strength to then enter other markets mm -hmm. and, and really destroy competitiveness. And one thing that really makes a free market and capitalism work is competition. So that's the fundamental question it, it, to me is, and it, it, it's, it applies to both consumers and other companies, is Apple doing something that makes it hard for competitors to exist, for innovation to happen. And that benefits us as mm -hmm. users, as well as other companies. 
this is going to be a very hard case uh, for the government to prove, I, I think. And of course, it's going to go on for years. And then the other question is, what's the remedy? Now, in the case of Microsoft, by the way, and I covered this in the late uh, 90s. It was, you know, we were doing tech TV and we covered it deeply. And I am of the opinion that that was a, that was a justified prosecution. And the government won. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't break up Microsoft. That might have been their initial goal. But what they did get is Microsoft to change its behavior, which was, from all accounts, completely, uh, you know, predatory against other companies. Uh, and they got an ombudsman to sit in Microsoft and watch their behavior. And from all accounts, including Steve Sanofsky's inside Microsoft, it chastened the company. And it made things like Google possible. So I think that that was, a, that was an example of a successful prosecution mm -hmm. that achieved its goals, did not break up the company, uh, but got the company to change its behavior in such a way that competition was improved. So the history of that is very, I think, very positive. Now, how long did it take? Ten years. Yeah. Uh, and it's this is going to take that long as well. The other difference is Microsoft had a ninety percent, more than ninety percent monopoly in desktop computing. Apple does not, mm -hmm. and I think that's going to. I think it's very possible a court will look at it and say, you know, you don't have a monopoly here. You don't have a case because if you don't have a monopoly. There is no violation. The whole premise of the Sherman Antitrust Act is that a company uses its monopoly to enter new markets. There's also something Cory Doctorow uh, and uh, Rebecca Giblin talked about in their Choke Point Capitalism uh, book, which was it has become of more interest of late, which is something called monopsony. And uh, this is something uh, that uh, I think the FTC is very interested in. I know Lena Khan is very interested in the idea that there's one buyer of services. Uh, Amazon becomes a monopsony when it's the only company that's buying books, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so a monopsony is another thing that they might look at. Apple has is a monopsony in its app store. Although interestingly, unlike the EU, the DOJ didn't really go after the app store particularly, which is... So maybe that I don't know what I don't know what their thinking is. I think it's a you know everybody who knows this stuff and I don't. Uh, I'm no lawyer. I'm I'm no expert in this. Thinks it's a well written case. Later today on Twit, uh, Kathy Gellis, who's a, an attorney and a specialist in this, uh, will be talking a little bit about this as well. Um, I think this is going to be a very difficult case for them to win. I think there is even a possibility it will be thrown out immediately by a court that says, hey, it's not a monopoly. Uh, there's also some dumb stuff in there. They, <laughs> they say that CarPlay is an attempt by Apple to take over uh, car uh, computing systems. Yeah, that feels just like they don't have an understanding of that aspect. Well, they may, and they may have, we'll see, they have to, you know, prove the case, but they may have uh, internal memos. They have a lot of yeah, documents fair. that say Apple says uh, in its deals with car makers, oh, you, by the way, you can't have anything else. But do they have enough market power to, to a, I mean, there are car makers like Chevy who said, you know, that's fine. We don't need CarPlay. So uh, GM said that. I think they backed down a little bit. Customers want CarPlay. So that will be an interesting, I think that that's a little far-fetched that CarPlay is an attempt to take over the car computing market. It'll be very interesting. Um, Corey Doctorow does, of course, uh, weigh in on this. Uh, he wrote an article on his uh, plural, pluralistic.net, hardest blog <laughs> name to say, the antitrust case against Apple. Um, one of the things he does say, which is very interesting, is the cult of Apple, the cult of Mac, believes that they are, despite the fact they're buying products from a $3 trillion company, a member of an oppressed minority. Yeah. You do see that. Uh, and that any criticism of the corporation is, in effect, an ethnic slur. Uh, they also believe that Apple's a virtuous company, that Apple would never, never do anything wrong. It's, it's, it's unlike any other company in the world in that they want to be good. They want to be private. They're doing everything they can to make the best possible products. And that is the marketing. That's, yeah, that's what they push. But I don't think it's the case. No. And, you know, there there certainly was a time many a year ago where I fell into that. And over time, did you get the uh, Cult of Mac Apple <laughs> logo? I came very in close. Your haircut? Yeah. Came okay. very close. Uh, but yeah, that I and you see that. And it's very frustrating because at that point, it doesn't 
kind of matter what you say or how good of a point you're making. The person's not going to hear anything other than. Corey know, raises that. another issue, which actually has nothing to do with the DOJ lawsuit, which is Apple's behavior in China, where when the Chinese government said, hey, no VPNs, Apple said, oh, yeah, yeah, of yeah. course not. Uh, and of course, Tim Cook just did a, a, a tour through China in which he announced, by the way, Vision Pro will be available in China. This is a big market for Apple. And it is, is absolutely the case that Apple does bad things for the Chinese people in response to the Chinese Communist Party. That is not in dispute, nor is, nor is it part of the lawsuit. Right. But if you think Apple is a benign company, just remember, they're not. They're, they have a duty to their shareholders to make money. <laughs> and it's always a balance, as Corey points out, with every company between alienating the customers, because you need customers to make mm -hmm. money, and making more money for the shareholders. And, and every company kind of weighs this. And Apple does the same. Apple does not favor the consumer, its users, over its shareholders. Don't think that you are the reason Apple exists. You are not. Uh, so we'll see. You know, there's going to be, we're going to have 10 years of fodder out of this. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Whether I'm we'll set. be here for 10 years. You'll be here. <laughs> I may be long gone. But uh, but in any event, uh, uh, there's there's going to be, I remember, you know, it started in 1998 on Tech TV. It was still going on when Tech TV went out of business. Uh, I, I think it'll be the Microsoft suit. So I think it'll be kind of like that. It's going to go on for a long time. I don't think they, the remedy is not to break up Apple. There's no point in that. Microsoft made a little more sense because they had different divisions. Apple doesn't. I think maybe the remedy is to just Apple knock it off. And, and I would love to see, frankly, let's just talk about whether the lawsuit is merit or not. Is, it, no, but let's talk about what we would like to see. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you like to see an opal, open ecosystem? Yes. Where uh, there could be app stores from other companies, where there could be other companies offering compatibility with iMessage? Yes. Where, I mean, we would, wouldn't we like that? Yeah, that's what I meant by wanting what the EU has forced Apple into yeah. doing. I'd like to see a lot of that and come I, and, to And I, don't, I think Apple is, is going kicking and screaming uh, with malicious compliance to the EU. The EU is not going to let that sit, I don't no, think. I don't we'll think see. so either. But uh, I think now Apple needs to be told, no, knock it off. Be, you got to be a little more open. You can pursue your strategy. You, it, you can continue to make the best products and win fairly in the marketplace. But you've got to let the competition compete. Spotify is a great case against Apple, yeah. right? Because Apple says to Spotify, you can't you can't sell your stuff on our platform without giving us a third of it. And uh, but we can uh, Apple Music, we can do whatever we want. We come in pre -installed. and pre-installed. We can pop all these little notifications up yeah. and encourage the user to subscribe right. and do all this other right. stuff. I mean, look, this is so it's going to come down. I know between people who who favor government regulation and think antitrust law is good and really want to break up all big tech. Yeah. And Apple fans who say, what the hell are you doing? This is a great company, successful company. This is exactly what the American capitalist system is supposed to be doing. Yeah, I can pretty much already map out the Mac Break Weekly arguments. You know, who, you know who's, <laughs> I know you know who's going to be. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I'm somewhat. And you're somewhere in the middle. In yeah. the middle. I don't, I don't know what the right answer is. I really don't. Right. But, but you and I agree, and I think that the sane heads will agree, more open would probably be a good thing yes. and it wouldn't hurt anybody. I 100% agree with it that. It probably wouldn't even hurt Apple's profits, to be no. honest. In many ways, it might open it up even more. They could Steve see Steve Jobs more. did not want to make the iPod uh, available on Windows. He did not want to ever do that. This is all comes from Steve, by the way. This has always been his fortress mentality. And his saner heads inside Apple said, no, Steve, we got to make iTunes available on Windows, that's the majority of users. They did. And that's when the iPod became a huge success. And so openness is not a bad thing. It's an opportunity, yeah. I think. Absolutely. All right. Enough of us talking about the news. What should we do next? Should we? Do you want? Would you like? <laughs> like I want to take a. I kind of feel like we should take a call and then we'll do. Because Micah did a whole thing in the other. He did a whole. He installed a whole new thing. And I want to talk a little bit about that. But first, John Ashley. All right. Uh, I see a, a gentleman hanging out outside, uh, enjoying himself. I so see I'm gonna, a silhouette I'm of a man outside <laughs> with his solo stove. Solo. <laughs> Hello there. Bring him in. Welcome to the show. I don't have a name. Hello. Hello. What's your name and where are you calling from? Uh, Andrew from Pennsylvania. Not Not Australia like you thought, but yes, you are. Correct you, you know, in honor of your uh, your um, 
flaming coffee. I have my solo stove, so you're right in picking that up. Uh, it's a beautiful, starting to get warm uh, weather out here. <laughs> you had a late breaking uh, winter storm back east, I know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 it's warming up. That's good news. Especially with the solo stove, that definitely gets you. Oh, I love those. Stove. Yeah, oh, aren't they great. great? And they generate they a lot of heat. Yeah. Well, nice. I'm so glad I you could enjoy the day. Mine. Yes. I, I measured mine with a, uh, my temperature gauge. The max it could do is a thousand fifty degrees. Woof. And it was off the it was off the scale, which <laughs> means it is. <laughs> When I get this thing going, it's probably over 1,100 degrees. It's the power of the sun in your backyard. <laughs> it's not using yeah. fusion. It's just using very rapid <laughs> oxidation of wood particles. So what can we do for you, sir? So I, I happened, I was just listening and realized, oh, wait, it's Sunday and you guys are live. So I am a club Yay. member, first time ever being in. We love uh, that. Thank Yay. You. Thank you. I was planning, actually, Micah, you had something on your, IS, your iOS show. Uh-huh where you talked about these chips that we could program for lots of different things. Timers, um, you had one example of being able to use it to have guests use your Wi-Fi. Ah, uh, NFC, yeah. Yes, and I, I was so thrilled. I had so many ideas to do with that. I ended up going and buying a bunch of chips. I could not get it to work at all with, with my... Uh, Wi-Fi for sure. I have Eros. Uh -huh. And so I couldn't get it to work with that. Um, I, I got frustrated and ended up giving up. I, I, we, the only things I was able to do, like one of the things I wanted to do is we have guests that stay over in our house. And I really love the idea of being able to just have them click a, a NFC chip mm -hmm. and DR my alarm system so they could go downstairs. But the oh, only way I cool. could do that is through a shortcut. Yeah. Right. And I could not how to do some of the things without me creating a shortcut on their phone. Yeah. So, um, the, so I'm, I, I really love the idea of being able to get the, them to just tap something and get connection to my Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. uh, but I couldn't get that to work. Uh, the idea of timers was neat. And so I need help. How, how did yeah. you actually do it? Because I tried Googling it. It looked like it couldn't be done through an iPhone, but you could do it on Google to, to get it to do the Wi-Fi thing. Yeah, so that should be possible. Um, first and foremost, yeah, when it comes to something like running a shortcut, uh, basically what your iPhone does is it scans the, the NFC chip and it uses that NFC's unique identifier to kind of say when this unique unique identifier is scanned that is paired with a shortcut on my phone that it then runs okay so it is not actually taking and writing that whole shortcut to the nfc chip it's referencing what's already on your device so you you are correct in what you were thinking where you would have to share that shortcut to your friends and then also probably have to have them have the the apps and all the stuff set up in order for the security thing to work unfortunate that's not as easy to do but with wi-fi that is something that you should be able to do. There's an app, uh, and it's funny because uh, one of our listeners has posted this app in Discord uh, called NFC Tools, and it's yeah. And I and I did use that one. Okay, no, I, I saw you guys used, and I tried that, and I didn't know if it was a problem with the Eros that was causing the issue. It should. I didn't know if it's something. It shouldn't be because essentially what you have to do is make sure that the encoding is correct uh, for the specific type of, of Wi-Fi that you're using and the Wi-Fi record is correct. Um, there is a chance. Did Do you remember, did you buy, uh, when you went to buy the tags, did you use it from our link or did you kind of go and find your own? I have had some NFC tags that did not have the proper um, encoding in order to do that. And the iPhone looks for more modern tags. Uh, and that could have been an issue. But if you used tags that we suggested, I'm not sure why it's not working. I'd have to do some more research. Yeah, I tried into it. five different tags. Woo! So uh, I, I did go with the cheaper ones at first, but then I eventually did go with the ones you recommended. 
and I still could not get that working. And I, I had trouble getting the timer to work as well. And hmm. so I was. So I, I mean, if it was a fabulous do you think it's idea, a problem like, with oh, NFC so or is it a shortcut problem? Well, so if you are trying to do a shortcut, so if you, if you, for example, created uh, on your phone, you said, when I scan this NFC tag, start a timer, right? And then you, you went through the process and you set up the NFC tag. Again, it's referencing the actual shortcut on your device. It is not referencing any code that's been sent and written to the NFC. So when you're doing that, all it's doing is saying, when I read this specific number, run this shortcut on my phone that starts a timer. Um, so you yourself should not have had an issue with it starting a timer. Uh, but if you did, then there's something else going on. I would need to do some more research to see. It could be that iOS is updated and that there's something at issue here. But as far as the Wi-Fi thing, I have not had an issue with that. So this cool. is another, this is one of those cases where I think a, uh, let me follow up on that is the best bet. Um, and so I would suggest if you could, uh, send us an email, ATG at twit.tv so that we know about, who you are. a QR code? Would that be a, a QR code? Absolutely works. Yeah. A QR code is another, now the, again, this is for Wi-Fi. Um, because the irony is here, by the way, one of the things the Department of Justice is suing Apple over is the NFC access. Mm -hmm. Now they're talking about pay for pay, yeah. for pay, but, but does Apple for a long time, Apple did not give you full NFC access. Right. It is fully allowed. It is now. Yeah. I have okay. been able to, yes, I, I, it, it does work. That only happened a few years ago that they opened that up. Yes. Yeah. The good thing about a QR code is that, right. It doesn't it can require, be anything. And, and that's the thing about NFC is that if the phone that's trying to do it for some reason is in low power mode, or if, uh, it needs to be, I mean, just the other day I had, uh, live activities stop working on my iPhone. It's because I needed to restart. Sometimes things just fail. So it could be that situation. The good thing about a QR code is it doesn't require anything other than the camera. And you would know if your camera is not working. Whereas with NFC, you might not know if there's a background process that's not working. So, so yeah, you can trigger can a shortcut with an NFC. You absolutely can. Okay. Yeah. One of the things I was thinking about, we're going to, you know, we're opening our studio next month for two twits, uh, almost full, I think, on one of them and completely mm -hmm. full on the other. So if you're a club twit member, make sure you uh, fill out the form and come out and see us. But we have Wi-Fi available to our guests and uh, we're going to make a QR code that we put on the door when people come in so they can scan it and quickly join our Wi-Fi. We don't have to give them out the password and all that stuff. And you could do the same thing, right, with un turning off the uh, alarm system, right? A shortcut could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, they'd have to have an iPhone, obviously, exactly. for the shortcut to work. But there are similar capabilities on Android devices, Tasker and others, that would uh, allow you to do the same thing. So, um, maybe a QR code would be easier. You wouldn't have to buy any additional hardware. He's buying, in case you don't understand, little stickums, right, that you put on things that have an NFC chip in it, and you could program it to trigger. I, when this first capability first happened, we were over in the old place, the brick house. I put those all over the place. <laughs> it was fun, but it yeah. never, it, nobody ever used it. So... <laughs> I think QR codes, as ugly as they are, are now much more ubiquitous and much more accepted and kind of understood that, oh, you scan this and something happens. Every restaurant we went to in Mexico, and I think it's still probably the case in a lot of places in the U.S., because of COVID, they have QR code menus. And and everywhere has QR codes now instead of a menu, uh, which, you know, means you have to have a smartphone, but most people do. So I kind of I kind of like the idea of maybe using a QR code instead of NFC. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm thinking that I this must have been uh, at a time when I was doing it on a beta, because everything I'm reading is exactly what you've said here. Uh, that Apple does have the NFC locked down. This is what they're getting sued over, kids. Yeah. And this, well, okay. So let me be clear. It is not locked down for everything else. You can use NFC to do all of those scans that we were talking about to yeah. do to run a shortcut. But specifically with Wi-Fi, <laughs> Apple cites it as a security issue yeah. where you would maybe accidentally yeah. NFC tap something. So I will say this. Use a QR, QR code. code. They don't have that locked it down it. because it requires yeah. more work from the user in theory. People who uh, use VRBO or whatever to rent their house as a vacation home will do this. They'll put... The QR codes up when we have people staying at our house to take care of a, the kitty cats. Uh, we'll put a little QR code on a piece of paper that they can use. 
right next to the instructions on how to use the 15 remote controls to watch TV. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yes, uh, use the QR code. You can go to the website I, that uh, Leo was talking about um, and generate There's a the lot QR of them. Code. The one I was showing is from bunch, Bitly. Yeah. But yeah, you just Google it. There, there are a million of them. Uh, Bitly, I like Bitly, but they probably track stuff. So... Yeah, they might. Yeah, there are privacy. There are open source privacy forward QR code generators. It's easy to find. Just search for open source QR code generator. There you go. Yeah, I, I love the idea that the NFC chip being able to just kind of hide it behind. Things. I know it's super cool. It should. I again, I am going to look into this because there are a few ways that you could technically have a website open up. That you yeah, have that's a good that thing. then and has then says, the, yeah that yeah. then lets you connect so again but they won't do it with Wi-Fi but they won't do it directly which means with Wi -Fi, I bet so. you they won't do it with turning off an alarm oh yeah that definitely. seems like a real security no, issue unless you shared the shortcuts but do send again send us an email uh, that I'll see that way I can get back to you with some follow up yeah sure and so with sharing the shortcut if I was to go that because the shortcuts work mm -hmm. but ah. so sharing the shortcut yes. I have they have to have that app. And they'd have to have the. They'd the have to have an iPhone. My, Any modern yeah, iPhone has shortcuts on it. have to have the security it. app as well. Oh, if, but they'd also. If have the yeah. shortcut yeah. is being done through the third party, yes, it's it's really it's not that part is not designed. Uh, what would be good is if uh, that third party. Uh, whatever security system you're using had some means of setting that up within the app where it says, you know, go to this URL and that disable. But see, that's just not something that's possible. So yeah, it would, yeah. it's, it'd be a lot to make it do it. The best thing that you could maybe do is uh, have the tag. I'm trying to even think of how this would work. Um, yeah, no, I don't think it'd be easy to do. You'd have to do a bunch of custom kind of coding and stuff to make it happen. Cause I was thinking you could have it prompt you when they scan the tag to disable the security system. Mm -hmm. It's a great idea and I'd love if that worked, but without some deep support from that third party that makes that security system, it's just not possible very easily on the iPhone. Here's another argument for more openness. Uh-huh. Yeah. You're making the argument right there. Yeah, it is. Imagine if your solo stove could only buy, yeah, that, burn branded wood <laughs> from the solo corporation, right? <laughs> that would be a problem. Yeah. I mean, the, the NFC tags were just really, really neat. I, I saw one person I agree. that had. Oh. Uh-oh. He's The solo stove has burned up all yeah. the connectivity. <laughs> And we've lost him. But it was great to talk to you. Thank you. Stay Thank you. warm in Philly, in Pennsylvania. Um, I, I, you know, I remember when the, this first became possible. And I, I literally bought dozens of these. And at little, they're little, you can buy them in a sheet, mm -hmm. just little things. And they're programmable. They don't come with any programming. And you program them with your phone. And then you can put them all over. And I had them all over the... Do you remember that, Burke? Uh, all the... <laughs> I had them on the tables, on the chairs, everywhere. I had little NFC chips. Uh, I don't think, I don't think anybody ever scanned them. I've got one under the desk in my office, and do what you? it does, yeah, NFC so code. All I do is I, I buzz. I just take my phone and go like this, and it turns on work focus. And yeah, that's it does nice. a few other things. That's a good idea. And then I've got one at home in my office that when I scan it, it triggers a home scene that turns on all of the That's lights really in my cool. office. Um, and then we've also got one in the shared space that can specifically set lights to like a movie mode. So do, so it doesn't matter which one you buy, right? It, the NFC chips I don't, <laughs> I would say this, it, sort of matters. If you go for the least expensive one, there's so little space on them that a lot of them will They don't have a work. lot of memory. Yeah. 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 So uh, try to not s just get one that's not the cheapest is my, <laughs> I know that's like weird advice, but as long as it's not the cheapest, I don't know because there are different kind of NXP two zero, blah, 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 blah. But basically as long as you get one, that's not the cheapest, that's been my experience that they okay. work pretty well. Here's $12 for 50. Is that the cheapest or no? No, that's not the cheapest. So okay. those would be good. You can get you can go less. Yeah. Okay. These are little yeah, so uh, it, it's the N tag rating, and I don't remember off the top this of my is, head. Uh, what NFC two fifteen. Yeah. Uh, N tag two fifteen yeah. is okay. Okay. So that's good. So you do know that that one's okay. And then you have to have an iPhone because you need shortcuts. It has to trigger yeah. an action. Yeah. And on the Android, again, I think you could probably do it with Tasker or a similar, exactly. uh, similar program. Exactly. Or if you want to uh 
with NFC, with an iPhone, if you write a website to it, for example, if you write um, a contact to it, those things are able to be used with an iPhone. It's just specifically the Wi-Fi code that, that Apple will not read. Oh, interesting. For sake of you for, know, for security. There, yeah, yeah. One. This has 504 bytes of storage. Which I guess is Which enough. Is, yeah, it's plenty for yeah. one thing. Remember, it's just going to be a URL or it's... Well, actually, it is a URL, mm -hmm. isn't it? Even for the uh, shortcuts. And they say you can read and write over 100,000 times, but not suitable for use in a strong magnetic environment. Fair so enough. if you're Magneto, <laughs> do not thing. use these, okay? <laughs> uh, here we go. It's time to show you this new thing that uh, my friend here, Micah, has installed... In our engineering uh, facility. As the Tech Guys is brought to you by the Eufy Video Smart Lock 330. Now, you know, we've talked a lot about Anchor. We love Anchor equipment. Eufy is Anchor's uh, kind of home security brand. And this is a new Smart Lock that does something that I think is really cool. It combines the camera that you might have from, a, you know, a, a doorbell with a lock that will unlock your door. Best of both worlds, one installation. Now, I'm going to let you talk about it because you did it. Yeah. Uh, so here I am installing it. It was a very simple process. Like I've just got a screwdriver there and that's all that was That's required. all you needed? It's all I needed. You slide in the deadbolt that comes with it. You install that part and then you put the front face and the back face on. Uh, it comes with a battery that's rechargeable, USB-C, which we love. And yes, this the thing that was so amazing to me about this device is that it is an all-in-one. It is a lock. It is a doorbell. This thing has a fingerprint I reader on it. I love the fingerprint thing. It, there's the battery that you plug in. Uh, it has a code. You can you know put in a bunch of different types of codes. So you could temporarily assign a code to somebody. Um, it was very easy to set up. We were just talking about QR codes. That's how you set this up in the Eufy app. And it also has, and this is a feature that I think is so amazing because you don't see this with a lot of these third-party systems, if all else fails, if the battery has run dead, if the code you can't remember, look at that. You swing this open. There's it's a got key. a key. It's got a that's key. Just, you know what? That's number one. My number one concern. The battery on this is 10,000 milliamp hours. It goes four months, thereabouts, and it'll give you a warning before it gets low. So you don't have to worry about that. But having a key... Oh, look, you can see somebody trying to get into our engineering center. Yeah, That's here's just, Burke saying, can you let him in? Let me in, please. Can and you let him I in? I said, okay, you can go in. Oh, And my I was goodness. able to let him inside very easily. This thing, I, I think it's really well designed, too. It's got some heft to it. I think this is really cool. A 0.3 second fingerprint reader, one second unlocking. Uh, Self-learning chip, they say, becomes more accurate. But here's the most, to me, besides the key, which I think is really important, I won't get a lock that doesn't have a key, it doesn't upload anything to the yeah, servers. Yeah, it's local. And costs you nothing. There's no subscription once you buy it. Obviously, you have to buy it. But there's no monthly fee. Everybody else charges a monthly fee for their doorbells. This is a lock and a doorbell and a camera with no monthly fees, no uploading to the uh, the public, uh, the internet. Uh, thumbnails are stored, uh, but not the actual video. Um, I think this is brilliant. 2K clear sight, two-way audio, enhanced night vision. You will enjoy an 18-month warranty, 24-7 professional customer service, a great product with a great price. Just search Eufy Video Lock on Amazon or go to eufy.com, E-U-F-Y dot com. This is a really cool product. I love it. Thank you, Eufy. Uh, we've been big fans of all of the Eufy products and all the Anchor products all along and Soundcore too. They do some really neat stuff. And uh, this one is especially compelling. EUFY.com or search for Eufy on Amazon. They told me, I said, well, how will you know if it's people who watch our show? They said, well, we'll know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't know how they would know that. But actually what they're going to track is how many people search on Amazon for Eufy video lock. So do that. Even if you buy it somewhere else, because <laughs> you can get this, you can get this uh, at your local uh, hardware store. But uh, even if you just search for Eufy Video Lock, yes, on please, please. Take, That's how they're going to that know. Search. That's the metric. I love it. All right, all right. Dicky Bartolo's coming up in about a minute. Woof.
Before we go to the Gizwiz, should we do one email? Let's just try to, to get an email in. Just to see if we can. Ooh. Website template suggestions <laughs> from Sean. Hello, Sean. I'm a longtime listener and watcher dating back to the tech TV days when I was a mere child. Now in my late 30s, I'm at... <laughs> <laughs> I'm an independent contractor. No, he was in high school. An independent contractor for a living, and I would like to set up a more professional space for promoting my work online, especially stuff I've done that's nice that I'm proud of, past work. My goals are simple. Now needing only one main page to serve as the home of a domain I already own. I have an online community all set up at. So he's got the domain. He's got an online community. He just needs a page to demo his stuff. I've looked at Squarespace. I'm wondering if there are any you know, standout recommendations. I want to balance a professional design, customer service from the company, mm -hmm. attractive pricing. There's three that come and leap to mind. Uh, Squarespace is one. Mm -hmm. uh, WordPress.com is another. Um, and then there's one that maybe you have not thought of, and I wouldn't have thought of, except that they became a sponsor uh, last year, Wix. And I thought, oh, Wix is just for commerce sites and stuff like that. They have, they're real. I was... I think yeah. I'm going to move my stuff over it's there. It's pretty cool. What I was do. blown away yeah. when Genuinely. I started playing with it. So uh, I would look at Wix as well. Um, let's see. what are, I have a fourth recommendation. Yeah, what, what other ones? Uh, but I, I did want to reiterate that. And I was you, so you, surprised. I thought, wow, this really, this is very modern. Yeah, it is by virtue of them being a sponsor that I was able to yeah. see more of what they so were we'll able be to honest. do. Yeah. yeah, that's the part where we're being honest is like, I wouldn't have gone and looked, but, but, but there was, and so I see this, these new things that you can do. And I thought, uh, I want to make a website just yeah, for fun. I did so, too. That yeah. was my reaction. Exactly. <laughs> so that's why we're talking about Wix, not just because they're sponsored, but genuinely got us both excited. But the other website I would recommend, and this is a website that I've used to create simple, quite literally, it is for one page designs. It's called card.co and that's C A R R D dot C O. I have a uh, one page design through them. It just depends how much, like if you wanted a whole photo album or video of, yeah, your, exactly. of your previous builds and stuff. Okay. You know, that's probably not the best place to do that. Right. Yeah. This is it's more so like a business card. It's a business card. It It is purpose built to be those. You scroll through, you see this. Can you have images there? You do what you, you want. Different website. I went to a Honda website. Uh, How did that happen? C A R D D O. No, C A R R D dot C O. Oh, I went to car dot C O and I got Honda. Okay, C A double R D. There yes. we go. Dot C O. John has these wavings and go. No, that's not it. Choose a starting point. Okay, so this is a one page. It's quite, yeah. It's you could have images, page, but yeah. I think it's more a business card. Because uh, if, the, if the you go, so go to mika.art, M I K A H dot art. Oh, okay. M I K A H. Okay. And I'll be honest. Who's that? that? This is a project that I have not oh, gotten back look. to. This was made with card, and you can click on those images, they become full size. Okay. So you can see. So he may be, if it's just stills of your cabinetry or whatever, yeah. he might be happy. Look at you. And. And I have not updated this with my latest I stuff. I like your I moose. I kind of forgot about this. But. Oh, is that your new niece? Yes. Oh, and that was a bee I made for her. She's so precious. What the hell it's is that? It's a trap. Oh, it's a trap. It's Admiral Akbar in crochet. And you gave me this Linux penguin. I really love my Linux penguin. You'll see him on uh, Windows Weekly all the time. Yes. It's sub Just my subversive <laughs> yeah, exactly. crochet. Linux, Linux, Linux. Linux, 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 Linux. <laughs> But yes, there are many options this out there nice. with different prices. And this is free? No, 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 no. Oh, it's no, not no, free, no. but it's very no, inexpensive. No, no, no. I think it was it like be much. $14 a year yeah. or something. Okay. So yeah, if you're looking for just a one-page site. You know what I like about this? Do it doesn't stuff. have any card branding on it. Yeah. It's, it's like you couldn't tell that it wasn't, it says copyright Micah Sargent, but you can't. It's it's very white label, yep. which is good. And you do, you, you'd have to pay for that. You know, I, some people would say, well, look at Blogspot. Uh, Google's blogger has, you know, is free, but it has ads on it. it has ad, you know, it has, it's a little less professional looking because it's got, you know, this is created by Blogspot and stuff like that. Uh, I, I think card C A double R D dot co for a simple page with some images, a few images, and then maybe look at Wix uh, as a kind of surprising dark horse candidate. I think what's happened is, you know, Wix has like 250 million sites. Mm -hmm. it, it's only the the only uh, bested by a WordPress, which is about a third of the a little more than a third of the internet. 
Uh, Squarespace only has a couple of million. So I think that tells you something about overall uh, us usability and customer satisfaction. Um, I, you know, I, I'm running a site over here in this in the corner <laughs> on my own with my own server, and, and it costs me nothing except you know obviously the power and the internet connectivity to run, uh, and it works quite well. So if it depends how technical you are, um, but but Leo.fm is is my own site that should still be up if the power hasn't gone out yes and uh i think honestly this can be this could also be easily if you're technical but see he wants something that's a little bit easier to use right that's my secret i don't tell anybody <laughs> about so shh. all right ladies and gentlemen i have been given word that i am allowed to show something i don't have <laughs> which is the new issue of Mad Magazine. Joining us right now, Mad's maddest writer and our gizmo wizard, Dick D. Bartolo the Gizwiz. Ba -ba -ba -ba. <laughs> Welcome. Hey, Dick and D. And also, Leo, you don't know this, but Micah crocheted me an electric car. <gasps> Definitely. Where do you put the batteries? It runs on oh, more everywhere. <laughs> it takes 16,000 double A's. <laughs> And they're all but hand the crocheting too. Is I, don't, I don't have to park it. I just roll it up and bring it in the studio. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's great. But it's hand wash only. That's the only problem. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I like it. I want one. <laughs> Make me one. How many balls of yarn did that take? <laughs> it was 300 skeins. It's quite a few skeins. Yeah. Dick anyway, Bartolo I sent you a photo. Oh, you sent us a photo. Let's see it. Yes, let's I, see it. I, I autographed the new issue to you guys. It's on its way, but we do have a picture of the uh, new oh, issue. Oh, of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there it is. And, yeah. A treasure trove and, and, of trash, <laughs> volume one. And it's got a little leprechaun because it was St. Patrick's Day a couple of days ago. And instead of a uh, pot of gold, he's got his uh, treasure trove of, of mad Garbaggio. Magazine. Garbaggio. Anyway, it comes out uh, April 8th. And I just needed to get permission. And they, called early today and said, yeah, you could be the first. Now, now the is there just story. one, there's only one person you told me in LA that's doing There the is thing. one person and that's who I was waiting to call me. <laughs> so Ethel, you call, well, you, you, you email Ethel and you say, hey, Ethel, can I show yeah. this? And oh, Ethel well, goes, it's Susie. It's Susie. it's Susie. I said, Susie, can I show the cover today? And she said, uh, let me find out. Let me look at Barnes and oh. Noble. Oh yeah. It, uh, so Susie has people, come, Susie yeah. has to call to get permission. And by the end of it, it's all the way up to the president who says, all right, Dickie D can show the Now cover. there's a reason why we prison. mention all this, because you are playing the what the heck is it contest for March and April. Identify. Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> this is, a few uh, ideas I this is for couples. Is this? <laughs> Is that, is that what did we not say? Is he that came what we're back from Mexico? Is that what we're thinking? Randy, I, I I know what it is. I know what it is. Uh, you know how sometimes when you're turning pages, you lick your finger, right? Uh huh. And you turn a page, and that's unsanitary. It's gross. Yeah. So this is a page turning finger that you don't have to lick. It's self wetting. You can send that in. Page yeah. turning finger. Page turning you can finger. Send that in. And to throw us. You put it in front of a mirror, so it looks like there's two of them. <laughs> Which I don't put that. Don't don't put him. Be he's not past him. He would do that. I think this is an, a medical apparatus for removing marbles you have stuck into your ears. <laughs> that would be good. Yeah, it's a little ear suction cup. <laughs> I like it. I'll have to send that in. <laughs> I like it. So if you can identify what it is, you're in the running for that new Mad Magazine. That yeah. Susie just put together, <laughs> uh, and uh, and there are six copies for the right answer. So don't get it right because there are twelve, twice as many for the wrong answer. As long as they're funny and cute, and we just gave you several examples of the wrong, wrong answer, very wrong answers. Yes. Yeah. So Dick usually joins us every month to talk about some fun thing he's found uh, online or elsewhere. What do you got for us? Uh, I have two things. One is one is kind of interesting. Hey, Dennis! Hi, Dennis! You can't get by, Dennis! You're no insane. sneaking through! Oh, he's trying to sneak through the today. studio there. Uh, what is he up to? Is he vacuuming? What is he? It does no, he was he was looking for a copy of that magazine. Oh, okay. Uh, that, that, he's uh, helping out. out to you. Okay. Yeah, so I was looking for a new laptop, and out of the blue, Asus sent me an email saying, we showed a brand new Zen book duo laptop this at the, CES. This is the nuttiest laptop. And we have laptop. some product samples if you'd like to <laughs> Did try Did you get one? one? 
Uh, they did. And oh I've been, God. this thing, when I first opened it, I thought it, oh, it's a real nice laptop. And then the keyboard comes off and there's a second 14 inch what? monitor. They're both 3K and 3K is what? 380? It's uh, halfway between 2K and 4K oh, okay. is 3K. Yeah, that, but your math skills are <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> Hey, by the way, uh, in, in your uh, famous one take video, uh, the Dennis shot, we get to see your studio from the other. Oh, that's cool side, to see, yeah. right? Look at all those. Uh, now you ring got monitors you Are you using it now, right now? Are you using it to talk to us right now? Oh no, that's Chad's new studio. Oh, well, where's the Zen book? Oh, here it is. Oh, no, they, they're, yeah, there. Oh, and the other thing is, I I was had a laptop on a big stand. This has a stand built in the back. Oh, this is kind of this. I could see a, a market for this actually. Yeah, and when the keyboard disconnects, then the other what monitor the? is <laughs> under there. What the what? What? Yeah, and so you'll see it in the next shot. This is for uh, day you, traders who want to go to Cabo <laughs> San Lucas, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Look at that. Oh, that stand. And comes with the it? great thing is, uh, it, on Amazon, I, I see it's back to out of stock. It's uh, fourteen ninety nine with the uh, Ultra Seven chip, and it uh, comes with a digital pen. Oh, so it's touch and screen. a little laptop case. Nice. Well, and, and soon there's coming. There's a version with the uh, Ultra Nine chip coming out. Oh, it's it's a terabyte of solid state drive. Wow. Uh, PCs so, have gotten so inexpensive. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Because you know, I live in Apple Land. In Apple Land, that'd be five thousand dollars. Right. But okay. That's really cool. Uh it's you know what? I'm, I'm revising it? my opinion. It's not for everybody, but if you need a mobile solution, I love it that it's got a stand built in. I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, this yeah, is the, a pretty the, good device. That helps that helps a lot. Yeah. yeah. That sells it's it the, to me. Uh Zenbook Duo. Zenbook Duo. Okay. Now this we have something from Micah's nieces and nephews. Woo! And it is new from Wowie, and it it is called uh, "Burn on a, a Finger." Sweet, oh, a sweet tweet. A sweet tweet. Tweet. Oh, yeah, I gotta click. I thought I thought a putty tat. It goes yeah. on your finger. It goes on your finger, and so it recognizes you. How it it has two separate functions. Things it can do on your finger and then things when you hold it in your hand. Let oh. me see. <laughs> I'm on Ask the Tech Guy. <gasps> it's the Gizmo. Wow. It's so repeating what you're saying. It, it repeats what you're saying up to eight seconds. You can put in secret messages and then hand it to a friend and... <laughs> Only he will be you able to smell hear it. like a monkey's butt. <laughs> yeah. You know how it's going to be used. Yeah. The yeah. neat thing, yeah. it's under ten bucks. Oh, I like oh. how the feathers go down. Oh yeah, you click, you got the feathers. Oh, they like pop up. The oh, feathers go up, and it lights up. It's very cute. You know, to paraphrase Joe in our uh, Discord, I'm and glad they, companies still make crappy products. They're fun. They're, they're fun. Things. They're fun. How much? Well, for I don't know. That it, it's, and, and it just came out last week, just in time for Easter. Oh, yeah. Only $9.99. Put this in your Easter basket. $9.99. Oh, uh, so, uh, see, the kids will love this. Yeah, there's a pink one and a blue one. So there's two different versions. The, the pink one's for boys, the blue one's for girls. Let's make sure yeah. you do it and right. And when I first yeah. put it on my finger, it said... Wow, you're an old person. <laughs> <laughs> did it really? <laughs> I said, "Yo, oh, you little." They have yeah, that's last Dennis year they did monkeys, right? And then this year <laughs> they they're did doing monkeys birds. last year. Yeah, okay. exactly. The monkeys are still available, but the the uh, <laughs> but sweet, they're so sweet. old hat. Everybody's you know. everybody's got <laughs> yeah. monkeys on the yeah. fingers. Do you, re do you remember when people cared about smartphones? And if you got a new phone, everybody gathered around you. Oh, God, not and, anymore. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, no, not anymore. I remember once I was at CES and a guy walked by and said, isn't that the so-and-so? And I said, yeah. And he said, that's six months old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was wow. on the airplane. A guy put on a Vision Pro, cleared out all the rows around him. Everybody moved. <laughs> so it doesn't have They're the same. They're worried he's going to suddenly start punching the, the air. the same appeal that it used to have. Yeah. 
It might have been because he uh, was in an exit row on a 737 Max. Might have been also yeah. that. I anyway, I, I was just going to tell you one of the articles that uh, is in here. I did it with Frank Santro Padre, and it's kind of funny. It is uh, practical jokes for funerals, putting the fun back in funerals. Oh, dear. Oh, how <laughs> dare they call that trash? Yeah, that's, exactly. That's uh, um, <laughs> Kleenex tissues that give you a black eye. <laughs> oh Lord! Oh, now, how does this work? Do you do you write the copy, all the copy, and then send it off, and then he illustrates it? Is that how it works? Yes. Well, well, well. Frank Santo Padre and I were both came up with a silly thing about funerals, so they combined them into I see. one super, and slippery then they edit casket. them, and then it, they send it out to the artist. But all of this is material from the past. So none of the writers or artists get paid anything. Oh, uh, do you remember so, when you wrote this? How old were you? <laughs> boy, I think I was, uh, you were in high school. <laughs> oh, no. Leo, I was, I was at Barnes and Noble yesterday and there's a new Star Wars book out. And, and I was there with Dennis and I said, Oh, this is interesting. Who wrote this? I, oh my God. I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, seriously, after, Writing there for 55 years and reading stuff, you forget sure. some of the stuff. stuff and people wrote. think maybe I was joking, but you did, in fact, write your first piece for Mad Magazine when you were in high school. Yeah. So a couple, and a couple of I finally ago. got my diploma. I forgot to mention that. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> How long yeah. does that take? It was stuck uh, in the well, mail I got for a it, while, uh, right? Let's say I got it Wednesday, so I can't do the math. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'll do one more uh, funny bumper stickers from funerals and it goes in your, on the bumper of your car and it says, if you can smell formaldehyde, you're driving too oh close. My God, that's horrible, <laughs> dude. Oh my God. But you know, we got to laugh. We got to laugh, right? If, yeah. Was, if, yeah. If we didn't laugh, we'd cry. Exactly. Of course exactly. it's a funeral, so it's probably okay to cry. No, because then you got a black eye. Oh, oh yeah. Don't use the tissues. <laughs> I Dick, love the you idea of the slippery those? casket. That's hilarious. <laughs> what is the casket slippery so people can't carry it? Or so that I, I, I think so, so that you can't carry it. Right? That's what it looks Dick, like. Dick, are you going to have some yeah, of these at I, your funeral? Yeah. What are you going to do? <laughs> oh, you know, I'm not, no, I'm going to be cremated. Then it's not going to be cremated and drop in the Hudson River. Oh. oh. Do they let you do that, or is you're going to have to do that by night? Uh, probably they don't. But years ago, you and I, when we were, you and I were doing uh, the Giz Whiz, yeah. I found, maybe they're still around, I found the sea urn. It, it is a biodegradable urn. So this can be thrown in the that. river with your ashes. Yes. But in about an hour, the entire urn will dissolve. So if they say you can't throw ashes in the river, you say, no, no, I'm just throwing some trash in. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm feeding yeah. the they, fish. They, yeah, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I'm feeding the fish. When we I were like in uh, Cabo San Lucas, somebody uh, waded out into the ocean to throw the ashes really? in the ocean. Yeah. Um, yeah, they can't. It's kind of hard to regulate that, right? Yeah, I think it's. At I think you're supposed time. to get three miles out before you do that. But uh, right now, there's some. Oh, I can't swim. I don't want to be that far out. <laughs> I don't think you can go that far out in the Hudson. There's no. It's, <laughs> It doesn't. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't quite work. The it's map. not like you go three miles up river and it's okay. You got to go three, three miles, miles away from shore. shore. Yeah. Offshore. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure too. Yeah. <laughs> Dick D. Bartolo, <laughs> Mads Maddest writer, the Gizwiz Show. He does two now. There's of course Gizwiz TV. You can watch the Gizwiz Show, which is every. You do that on every Thursday. Thursday. And every Wednesday, the day before, he does the Giz Fizz, which we used to do here after Twig. Same time, but you go to gizwiz.tv to watch the Giz right. Fizz. Right, yeah, that's at 8.30 after you guys should do you. Uh, Thank you. This this weekend. I wouldn't want to be competing with we, the Giz We don't Fizz. compete. That's why I pushed it off till 8.30. <sighs> I, I know my limits and uh, <laughs> I can't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't dream of it. Wouldn't <laughs> dare. Yeah. Well, Micah does an incredible job when you're away. By oh, the way. thank you. Yeah, we no. got very good uh, feedback on the twig that you did uh, on Wednesday. People loved oh, good. that episode. It was a very, I think yeah. we should have you on twig all the time. In fact, Dick, I told Micah he should be on all my shows. And then I'll start taking vacations and I'll slowly just 
drift away into the background, and it'll be Micah's well, show. Well, no, you could be his substitute. I'll fill in for Micah. <laughs> yeah, there you actually, go. Actually, that's the deal. I'd be glad to do that. So that way, every few you know, months. Actually, Micah never goes on vacation. <laughs> oh, We'd have well, to get him. To, yeah. Then your career's over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to force me to go on vacation. <laughs> you have to go on vacation. Leo needs some airtime. <laughs> Dick, it's always a pleasure. You're the greatest. We oh, love you. Yeah, and uh, it was nice to see Dennis. Yes. Yes. And happy Palm Sunday. Oh, yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it's great fun. I don't know if that matters to you. Get going to church. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. He's a, he's a good Italian boy. Thank you, Dick. Bye bye. Okay, see you, next see you later. Okay, bye. All right. You're bye. watching Ask the Tech Guys, Micah Sergeant, Leo Laporte. We're going to get back to the phones. We should in just have brought a some fronds in. Should have for Palm yeah. Sunday. I don't want to mock it. Well, no, no. We, uh, well, yeah, maybe I need to know what, what exactly. Why there's the, palms yeah. involved. Yeah. yeah, I would want to read about it first. Yeah, we don't really know it's much like about that. like a palm that. tree. Yeah. But next week we can lay eggs. By the way, the uh, the Discord is uh, weighing in, and they say more mica on all of the shows. Well, that's very kind. I agree with them, hundred percent, hundred percent. If you are not in the Discord, you're wondering what is the Discord? That is the club we call Club Twit. It is the least exclusive club in the world. Anybody with seven bucks in their pocket can join, <laughs> and the benefits are great. All of our shows ad free video for all the shows that we do, many of which, I mean, everything we do is available in public, but a lot of it's audio only, like iOS Today, uh, hands on Macintosh, hands on Windows. You get the video too if you subscribe on Title Linux Show. You also get additional events like Stacy's Book Club that we do from time to time in the club, and uh, access to the Discord, the chance to chat along with other viewers actually i was in the discord during vacation because it's more than just a chat about the shows it's a chat about everything geeks are interested in we've talked a lot about coding when i was uh, when i was there because we have some i have some smart people in there who help me uh if you are not yet a member of club twit we would love to have you visit twit.tv slash club twit seven dollars a month 84 dollars a year there are company plans there's also family plans uh and the real reason to join is to give you that heartfelt feeling that you're supporting the work we're doing here. We want to be here in 10 years when the Apple DOJ lawsuit is settled. But the only way that's going to happen is with uh, with support from you, our audience. Lisa and I, uh, because we were on vacation together, I hope that's not a revelation. <laughs> uh, our CEO, uh, 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 who happens to be my wife, um, we were on vacation. We talked a little bit about what we think of as the future of podcasting. And like the future of all media, you know, uh, it's grim. It's really grim. Uh, Ad-supported media is is uh, struggling and podcasting uh, along with it. Of course, there's some big shows like Joe Rogan's show and, you know, Call Her Daddy that are that are surviving. But this is what happens. Uh, this is what happened to blogging, too. The, the little kind of uh, niche shows uh, are struggling a little bit more. And... Um, we're not uh, alone in that. We want to keep doing it, though. So with your help, maybe we can. Twit.tv slash club twit. I am ready for another call. How about let's do uh, this voicemail right here. Hey, I'm Robert from Charleston, South Carolina. A quick question about um, YubiKeys. Uh, I'm a diligent listener of um, Steve Gibson and... While most of the stuff goes over my head, um, I did want to ask how I might be able to use the UV key for different applications. I've tried to read through their notes and like for Windows, when I try to use it to log into my Windows account, it asks me to create a pen, but um, some accounts don't need a pen. Uh, and then when I try to use the Microsoft pen, it, it, it tells me um, that that's the wrong pin and to create a new one. So it's kind of confusing. Is there any way you can show me how to set that UBK key up, uh, especially for my Microsoft account, but maybe for uh, other accounts like Google or some such? Um, thank you for, thank you again for all you guys do. All right. Bye. Great question. Yeah. Uh, I, quickly, before, before we answer that, I do want to say arguably one of the best couple of episodes, I'm sorry you were gone of security now uh, took place these last two weeks because it was all about um, two-factor authentication with passwords versus the future, which is pass keys, and how Steve Gibson made the argument that pass keys 
alone are far more secure than any other technology that we have right now. And it result that was the first episode where he sort of made that statement. And the second episode was following up with what people were talking about. But we talked about how the YubiKey is essentially the pre uh, precursor. It, yeah, the precursor to yeah. what pass keys are. Yeah. I um yeah, essentially, the whole idea of of all of this is there are basically three ways to prove that you are who you say you are, right? And one of the ways has been completely dominant for the last 30 years, which is the password. That's what we call something you know, okay? Something that you have in your head. And if I challenge you, Micah, and I say, Micah, are you the real Micah? You might say, well, I am, and I can prove it because I know something only Micah would know that you uh, wear underwear made out of baloney. <laughs> and and then that would be that would be something you know. Yeah. That'd be one way you could prove That's the challenge. The it's a challenge. And the password is of course not I'm wearing underwear made of baloney, no, although that would be a good password. Baloney underwear 547. Yeah, add a little pound, something, maybe your old mark. childhood phone number. Yeah. So that's one way. The the other way is something you are like your fingerprint or your face ID. That's pretty secure. Iris, you know, sometimes uh, that you'll use an iris or you see that in, in science fiction movies. Um, actually, Clear uses iris. Um, the government uses iris in global entry, things like that. Uh, so something you are, a biometrics. And the third way of identifying you is something you have, something physical that you have. Now, of course, the one way to do this has been around for a long, long time. And you might even remember those football dongles that would generate six digit numbers you remember those maybe mm -hmm. not I, I used to have one for paypal and you every you press a button and it would it would give you a new Just number pop up with it and yep. you'd enter it in that that's turned into of course the authenticator which you have on your phone uh yubikeys came along in fact steve was one of the big proponents of yubikeys back in the day um when he met their uh, ceo stina uh at a uh, conference these are little hardware devices that do the same thing as your authenticator device. They generate a time-based one-time password, a six-digit code uh, that will then identify you are who you say you are. Uh, the way YubiKeys worked was quite clever was instead of having to read the code and type it in in the early days of the football, this actually emulates a keyboard. So when you stick it into your USB port uh, and press the button on it, it types out. And it's more than six digits, but actually, if you look at the digits it's typing out, the first many of them identify the YubiKey. There's a lot of information in there. But essentially, it is a one-time code. And the YubiKey has enough compute power to generate a new one uh, every 30 seconds or that kind of thing. Now, of course, when you're talking about pass keys, it's still something you have. You may not kind of realize it, but the way pass keys are stored is in a secure enclave, whether it's on your computer, in your password manager, or more commonly in your smartphone. So it counts as the third form of authentication, which is something you have. We've talked a lot about two-step or two-factor authentication. It's having two out of those three, something you know, something you are, something you have to identify you. Steve likes uh, pass keys because it is both something you have mm -hmm. And something you are, because on almost every case, you'll have a authentication that is secondary, a secondary channel of authentication, face ID or touch fingerprint re recognition uh, or a password sometimes on your computer that then unlocks that passkey. So it is giving you a second factor as well as your password. And in many cases with passkeys, you can replace passwords, but passwords are always there as a fallback. So... Um, I, you know, I'm not sure I would say I would agree with him that pass keys are superior to a YubiKey. They're functionally very similar. Um, they're a little, the reason I'm not as f fond of them is, well, there's problems with both. The The problem with pass keys right now is it's tied to whatever device you created it on. Right. And so if I make pass keys on my iPhone, I better, I better stick to apple that was the biggest thing that steve said right now is that he he knows that of course if fido is working on a portability i'm not convinced um, they are they didn't write that in on purpose because they thought that was a security issue the idea that you could say well i want to move to android so i'm gonna take all my pass keys with me is a security flaw. so you think they might not ever they didn't put it in on purpose that's scary because that's uh, what keeps me from using pass yeah. keys right now. Now you can use one password, password or Bitwarden. Many yeah. password managers will eventually support pass keys. They will become something you have. 
but because by virtue of the way they work, you'll be able to have them on all your devices. So I still think there's a lot to be said for a YubiKey. Now, here's what's the negative of YubiKey. It's damn hard to figure out. And that's what you were talking about, uh, our, our voicemailer. Uh, this is a YubiKey. Um, what, the way it generally works is uh, when I create an account that supports hardware authentication, let's say my Google account, they support it. They really promote it, in fact. Uh, I will enter a password, I'll log into my account, and then I can go into the security settings and add a second factor. Now, that second factor can be an authenticator. It can nowadays be a passkey, or it can be a hardware authenticator like this YubiKey. Here's a couple of the drawbacks. If you just have one and you lose it, you're in trouble. So you're going to have to own two, mm -hmm. and you're going to have to keep one in a safe deposit box or somewhere that's absolutely safe so that... You notice I, w I reached back to, to get my YubiKey off my keychain. I carry this with me everywhere, but you better be sure I have another one in, at home. So if I lose this one, I can get into my Google account. So that's one drawback. The other drawback is, you know, it's, it's, it's techie. It's complicated. So our, call, our uh, caller asked an interesting question, which is how can I tie it to my Windows login? Uh, and that, it, that requires some, some pretty interesting machinations uh windows hello is the authentication the pam as it will as it were module for windows and so you need uh to support a yubikey in pam i think yubikey yubico the company that makes these has software that you would download and install on windows to make that work and generally they do have a pin because um they they want a fallback method frankly i have an uh, article that will give you an example of how ridiculous it is. This is a configuration cheat sheet for YubiKeys. Came out uh, a year ago from Debugging.Works, which is a, a personal blog. And he's given a bunch of ways to do this, including time-based one-time passwords, which are the authenticator things. Uh, so it's worth, yeah, I'll put a link nice. in this. This is worth having. Universal second factor. Um SSH with FIDO2, it ends up being, and this is the real reason Steve likes passkeys, the harder something is to use, the less likely you are to do it. Yep. And so I, I use this on my most secure stuff. Same. Because it's worth it to me to keep it secure. But it's not easy. Right. Uh, I think it's possible to do, I know it's possible to log into a Mac with this, I, I know it's possible to log into a Windows with it, machine with this. It's going to take some effort. I, I set that up one time and it was a nightmare <laughs> because it, it, it was just, it was difficult to, when I said, actually, I don't want to do this. It was difficult to undo it. You have to do a lot of terminal commands to uh, yeah, get rid of it. Yeah. It, it's, it's kind of, I'll put a link in the show notes to this article just so you can see what's involved. Um, I, my, my strong suggestion Honestly, Microsoft made it as easy as possible to log into Windows using the Microsoft Authenticator. Uh, in fact, you can do it passwordless with the Microsoft Authenticator. You'll go to your Windows, you'll enter your email for your Microsoft account, and then it'll say, okay, I'm going to send a, I'm going to push a notification to your Authenticator. If this is correct, enter the number and it'll tell you 92 or whatever. And you go to your phone where the Authenticator is. That's two-factor, right? Something you have, uh, and it's very secure. And it's, and it's within the Microsoft ecosystem. It's their authenticator. I think this is by far the best way to log into Windows or to any, to any Microsoft account. So that's what I would recommend. Instead of using a YubiKey, uh, use this. Oh, and it uses, by the way, Face ID. So it is, it is uh, on the iPhone, and it would probably use fingerprint or face on an Android phone as well. So it's, it's pretty secure. You still have to have the phone. The good news is because it's a Microsoft account, there are fallback methods. You know, there, it's, it's, I think it's well done. Strongest recommendation for both Mac and Windows is to use their built-in systems yeah, rather it, than a third-party YubiKey. And and the question about the pin, um, that is something that I've had an issue with in the past. Make sure that you did not accidentally create a pin with the YubiKey itself and that you're not using that pin when you're trying to type in the pin for Microsoft because those are two separate pins. Uh, I recommend using personally the YubiKey without that extra pin 
and then just use that Microsoft pin as the pin, if that makes sense. So that this is specific to the caller. Uh, Leo's advice has been very general for anybody using YubiKey, but specific to the voicemail, you mentioned the part where you were having trouble with a pin. YubiKey lets you set a pin for the YubiKey. You may be getting the two of them confused. Yeah. And yeah, that's right. There's a Windows pin that's separate from the YubiKey pin. By the way, I, I thought, oh, the best thing would be this YubiKey with a fingerprint reader. That's even worse. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> I actually stopped using this. YubiKey at their website, yubico.com, has the steps that you would have to go through uh, to secure Windows using strong authentication. Uh, I, you know, I personally think the way Microsoft has set it up is probably the best, uh, the best way to go. It's very secure. They've done a very good job with the authentication. Secure and convenient. Yeah. And it's cool that you can I do I think both. Steve's point is well taken, which is this is uh, a technology that is rapidly becoming obsolete thanks mm -hmm. to thanks to pass keys. Yeah. And with, with pass keys, and this is the thing that I love about what he said is part of the reason why we like to use these little things is because it's kind of cool and it's a little bit <laughs> high tech and sort of spy like and bondy. And so whenever we're faced with something that's so quick and convenient, like a pass key, we immediately we have suspicion. Yeah, yeah. Like, this is too easy. This too can't easy. be better. And yet all signs point to it absolutely being yeah. a very secure thing. So yeah, I really I'm sure like there'll it. be more follow up uh, on. I'll the, show you on what happens. Uh, let me go to uh I'll log out of it, but go to my GitHub account and sign out and show you what happens um, when I have, uh, I'm just going to sign out of my GitHub. When I go to GitHub, I have it set up to go with pass keys. So I sign in. And of course I have my password, which I'm going to use from Bitwarden to sign in. And then it says, okay, two factor, factor authentication. When you're ready, authenticate, use the button below. This is why we <laughs> geeks go, what? I mean, use the, click this. <laughs> And I click it, and then look what happens. Bitwarden, which has your pass, my password manager has not only the password, but it has the pass key for yeah. it. That is that is all it takes. And now I'm logged in. It. Yep. And, and so I like that. I've GitHub implements it very, very nicely. They do. And that's where I, I am currently using pass keys only as two factor, not as just my login. Right. I, I'm Although, not ready to move to that yet. Notice it did give me that option. Yes, yeah, so you could have just logged key. in with pass key. Just that, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that you know pass keys are great. Uh, it's not going to be universal. Out. Yeah, there are going to be plenty of sites. Look, your bank still makes you get a text message on your phone, Lord. which we know <laughs> is not secure. Uh, and that's not because the bank doesn't know it's insecure, but because the bank's customers are normal people who who don't understand all of this fall to all. Well, because of that, you're going to see passwords probably as long as you're alive. There, it's just not going to be phased out for pass keys. Pass keys are just going to become another thing. And that's the problem. What is that? That's the old XKCD uh, comic about standards. The only problem with standards is <laughs> it generates more yeah, standards. more standards. <laughs> All right. What else should we do, John Ashley? What do you want us to do now? Um, we should probably do it. Let's do another email. We had a okay. I got emails. There. I got email. Wait a minute. This is the one I did, I think. Yeah. And by the way, you can uh, call in at call.twit.tv. That's the website you go to, or 888-724-2884. And this is from The Willow Woman. Hi, The Willow. I like The Willow Woman. Lisa, The Willow Woman. Willa, Willa, Willa. Lisa from Austin, formerly from New York. Proud New Yorker. Can you tell? Yeah. I can tell from your you accent, Lisa. <laughs> I've taken the plunge and I'm getting rid of our cable TV, Hulu TV. Here we come. Now I want to take control of my home network. <laughs> she probably doesn't talk like that. Uh, we have f Spectrum 500 megabits per second upload speeds and are happy with that. That is good for upload. That's very good. She's probably on fiber. But since I'm the tech support for my household, I'd like to get more control over our modem and router and stop renting them from Spectrum. You're right. You're right, Lisa. That's the right thing to do. Can you give me a recommendation for these devices? I am tech proficient. I can handle an installation and setup. P.S. I will eventually upgrade to Spectrum 1 gig. So uh, whenever you get your uh, internet from a cable company like Spectrum, you have to get there. You have to get something to demodulate the signal coming in over the coax. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's coax... If you don't have fiber, but you're getting coax, you can buy your own cable modem. And Spectrum will have a list of cable modems it recommends that you can use. 
And that's a good idea, I think. I always separate, and I think you agree with me, the modem from the router. Yes. Right? So you really need two pieces of hardware. Now, if you're getting fiber from Spectrum or any company, they're going to have a fiber box. And I would recommend the uh, the uh, uh, the terminal adapter uh, that they use. I would recommend sticking with that. Don't get a third-party one. But you can get your own router. So if you're on cable, you can get your own cable modem. If you're on fiber, stick with the OT that they provide you. Um, it, but then you, in both cases, you can get your own router. And that's really where the rubber meets the road, right? All a cable modem or an OT is doing is converting that signal into Ethernet, something you can use, whether it's coming in over coax or through fiber. It's, doesn't, it's not Ethernet. So it's converting that to Ethernet that you can use. And then any router will work with it. You use an Eero. I use Eros at home. Uh, I have family members who use Eros because it means that I'm able to help them with theirs. Uh, have had them now for years. Have upgraded from one Eero system to another. I've stuck. I've stuck with Eero because it does what I needed to do, and it also means that my partner, who's not as um, tech minded per se, can also troubleshoot if need be. Uh, whereas if you would like more control, if you are a bit more nerdy, if you do want a bit more fun, there are other options out there that have a lot more configuration that you can do on the back end. Yeah. Spectrum on their website, if you are a Spectrum cable customer, has authorized modems to use on the Spectrum network at spectrum.net slash modems. And, uh, and that's super important because they will give you the runaround if you try yeah, they to get won't be one that happy. won't work. Yeah. That they say won't work. Some of them would work, but they just, yeah, just make sure you get one that is on their list. We like the Eris, right? We the, do like the Eris yeah. and the, um, what is it, the... Netgear makes one as well. Yeah, the, I think the Netgear is, Netgear is very good. Netgear is other good one. I think I use the Netgear CM1000, I believe is what I use. Uh but you have on my cable system. Yep. You'd have to. Yep. Have CM one thousand for yeah. sure, and yeah. then yes, uh, the and Motorola. We found out last time is getting out of the business. They are. So get it from Eris or Netgear. My recommended be they should be the Netgear CM one thousand. Um, but again, you want to make sure that it's something they recommend, which they do, by the way, and uh, that it's Doxis three point one. Mm -hmm. Okay, very important. Not three point oh. That's one of the things they're going to want is a three point one. Doxis, you're going to see it's not cheap, but how much a month are you paying at Spectrum to use their equipment? This way, you're getting more modern equipment. Uh, honestly, if if Spectrum's giving you this, which I think they might be, or something com comparable for four bucks a month, that'd be worth it. Yeah, and you can always just use their modem slash router combo and then as just the modem. Turn off the router. Turn off the router and, and use, use your, your modem, especially if you're proficient. I mean, you'll you're know right. how to use that. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of choices on routers. Uh, the Eero is nice because it's mesh and it's pretty easy to pretty use. Pretty easy to set up and easy to configure. Easy to configure. Uh, I've used the Orbi in the past. That is a very good router. That's from Netgear. Uh, currently, I use Ubiquiti Gear. Yeah, I think the only mesh system I would not recommend at this point is Google Wi-Fi. Yeah, I'm not fond of too it. Too many people with too yeah. many complaints about yeah. it. Uh, which is too bad because there was some real promise yeah. when they came out with that. Uh, but yeah, I gave mine away. I, they I make too many compromises yeah. on things. And, yeah. and if you go to support. Ubiquity, uh, when I recommend Ubiquity, I'm not recommending their uh, their consumer uh, Wi-Fi stuff, which I have used and didn't like very much. I'm recommending their prosumer stuff like the Ultimate Dream Machine, the UDM and things like that. That's for a more uh, expensive <laughs> and more kind of semi-pro uh, setup. So... Um, yeah, if you feel like fiddling around with it, and yeah. I guess if the Willow woman likes to fiddle. Yeah, and if you're okay, she's with a fiddler. Anybody else in your house not being able to know what to do with it, <laughs> that's what you want. Well, you know, and this is why I went with Ubiquity, and I've told this story before, but we got somebody to wire the house because it was during a pandemic, and uh, we were all working from home, and I wanted to make sure we had very good responsive Wi-Fi uh, as well as wired. So wired to all the TVs, wired to all the workstations where the computers were, and then high-quality Wi-Fi throughout the house. And that was a ubiquity prosumer system with a dream, ultimate dream machine and a switch and a big PoE switch. And it's really, over the years, sorry about that, it has proven to be quite good, uh, quite reliable, and and uh, nobody's complained. Uh, Joe is reminding us in the Discord, that's what that noise was, Joe is very persistent, that he <laughs> likes the uh, Synology DSMs. 
The Synology routers are quite good. I know. I remember Father Robert really liked his. So, uh, yes, some very good choices out there. Uh, okay. You know what time it is? It's time to pause. And refresh. And enjoy the Zen. You're watching Ask the Tech Guys, Micah Sargent and Leo Laporte. Let's do. Uh, I don't know. What do you want? I, I feel like we should. We 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 should talk to somebody. Yeah. You know, is there somebody to talk to? Um, I know. We we blew it because we said only new callers yeah. and everybody hung up. Yeah. Well, no, we had some callers, but a lot of a number of them. Uh, they must have not been able to stick around. Is yeah, what it they was. weren't able to stick around. I know uh, John has been on in the past, but I know he's been hanging out for a bit. And uh, let's and take let's, John. Yeah. I don't want to be rude. Hello. John, where are you calling from today? Hello. Can you hear me? I hear you, John. Welcome to the show. Hey. I'm glad to finally get a hold of you. I've been trying for I know, a couple of months or, I don't know, a long time. Well, welcome. And, uh, I'm a member of the Club Twig, of course. Thanks. And, uh, I, 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 I spent too much time listening to your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> There's no such thing. I know. It's really ridiculous. <laughs> so I have two. I have two questions. One is about OTP auth, which is which I really like. I I save all my codes in there and secrets and whatnot. But sometimes the face ID doesn't work and it asks for a password that I do not have. And then when face ID comes back again, which it will eventually, and I want to change the password. Uh, password it wants the old password which i do and i have so are you running this as a server in your uh on a home server no this is my iphone okay so it's an app for the iphone right all right so i'm looking at otp auth on github and that is actually something that uses node.js and you would run uh oh really yeah but oh, that's not the one i guess you're running you're running run through the iphone i might look at it but that's not the one no don't use that i'm going to tell you what one to use <laughs> at least it's the one yeah. I use. And Face ID yeah, works I, with it. It's very reliable. And John, you'll like yeah. this. Although right now Face ID is turned off. It has really big numbers, oh. <laughs> which makes it easy to read. It does it in alphabetical order if you want. Uh, well, I used Authy well, for a long time, but Authy, I, you know, there's a couple of problems with I Authy. I use voiceover. I use voiceover. Oh, that's right. I remember, John, you're your voiceover user. That's why you like OTP Auth. Um, I yeah. don't know how this but, would work with voiceover. I would think it would. Well, it works fine, actually. Oh, good. Um, You've tried it. But what I'm saying is, if Face ID doesn't work, it's asking for a password, which I don't have. And when I try to then go back, eventually Face ID will work. When I go back to, to, so I want to set a password, it says, what's your old password? Oh, <laughs> Have you tried getting in touch with, um with let me see i just was looking at it with who with, with the developer whose name is roland mowers oh i think i did write him one time and never heard never heard back yeah hmm. i wonder if this is uh an app based on the open source version of it that roland has uh, put out it says, okay, I forgot the password needed when opening OTP auth. What can I do? It says, unfortunately, there is not much that can be done besides remembering the password. It's used to encrypt your accounts. It can't be restored without the password. The only option is to restore the accounts using account backups, whose password well, I do you have know. that. I do have backups. I, I do back it up every now and then. So I have so I, I've seen the backup where it's on the on the my uh, iCloud, you know, uh -huh. on the iCloud. It says the process there is to, if you have a backup that doesn't have a password on it, delete OTP. Well, no, it does have a password. Then it's always had a password. You just don't that remember it. Is. That pass, that password, I know what it is. The password for the backup itself. Oh well, that's good then. Yeah, then you can restore from then. Well, so, so then what? So so what is it saying to do? Delete the app. And, yeah, you're going to reset. Yep, delete it from your device. Reinstall it open and let it finish the initial setup process. And then it says this time, make sure you save the password in a safe place. And then it says restore uh, using the import the account option, or you can also use restore from the backup. Oh, and by the way, I'm reading the reviews of OTP auth. 
And this is why I know Roland Mower's name. I'm an avid fan of Steve Gibson's podcast, Security Now. This is the one he recommends. Oh. So maybe ah. that's where you got it, right. John. Um, maybe it is. Yeah. And and now I have another question about iMazing, which I know you guys ah, love. Yes, iMazing. He's he's the iMazing guy. He's the guy who got me to use iMazing. Tell me what your question is, friend. Well, my question is this. Uh, after a while, sometimes it won't work. I back up via Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. and so every night, the silly thing, of course, Apple has it so that you have to enter your password every time you back up from uh, from the iPhone to your Mac, which is really kind of dumb, but all right, they, they, they want to do it that way, uh, and that's fine. But after a while, sometimes it will actually stop working. Sometimes if I reboot the Mac, it'll come back sometimes i have to 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 use usb it, it gets to be really annoying and i don't know what that does sound annoying um this, I will, by the way i just want to say this is why it's so you know if you are blind for instance you, and you want to use technology you got to go through 10 times more work than sighted users mm -hmm. do well you do and i, I admire I you john because you re you really you don't give up you work hard at it and you're and you use technology, which is great. And I've done it for a very long time. In the old days, I had, I can tell you, I had, you know, different applications. Ever since the 1980, I I, I used something called UUPC in 1992. Yeah, with my internet. Yeah, I connect UUNet. Yeah, it's you. It's news groups. Yeah. Those groups and I still and email use email. Yeah, and, 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 uh, and you're a, and you're so, an old timer if you use UUPC. That's awesome. That predates oh, yeah, the that World was, Wide Web. Oh yeah. <laughs> so that was the first thing, and I had it on my. I love it. Boss modem and you know everything, and John, it was really. Props to you. Just props to you. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. The, you know, it, I know you work twice as hard, mm -hmm. ten times as hard as. People were excited to use this technology, but you don't give up and you do it. And no, bless you. I don't I give think up. It's great. And every, and uh, I mean, just the other day, it, it was it, there was some something, uh, and I and it was some technology. I forget what it was even now, but I I just wouldn't. I just would. I just kept doing stuff, doing <laughs> stuff, and just finally I got it. You know, I mean, it was just you know, I I I beat it to death until it squeaks. <laughs> <laughs> Very well done. I like that. I think that's great. So, Do you, you have know, an eye amazing I solution for him? So I don't. I don't have a solution for you, uh, unfortunately. The only so there's a. Do you know why it does? It's doing just, that? Yeah, there's a possibility as to why it's doing this, and uh, my guess is it's still connected via Wi-Fi. So right. It, it appears sure. as if it's still connected by a Wi-Fi via Wi-Fi, but what I think is probably happening is it needs to re. Okay, so when Apple is triggering that uh, process of doing a backup, your backups are of course uh you know securely locked and i think that it's probably an authentication thing and i don't know if iMazing uh, has you know done it can't the, get around yeah that. It, it can't get around that that authentication so i'm wondering if what's happening is you uh plugging into usb after a while is kind of re-authenticating and allowing that to happen sometimes However, that works and sometimes it does sometimes i have to reboot the mac to, to, to get it to work yeah and see that's that's too much so what i'm going to recommend that you do is go yeah. to support.imazing.com and submit an uh imazing request the team is very uh responsive I've found oh, and it, that's very difficult to do because they make you give your keys and I mean it's it's just horrible again see we don't yeah as sighted it's users easier for us we don't experience no, no, these but, troubles but, uh and we think make, it's easy make, but it's not is it the thing they make you the stuff they make you do to to get a support request is you have to give your serial your numbers and it's really yeah, pain in the touch. Yeah. And well, I can do it, but I kind of hesitate. You yeah, know? you were wondering if we had a quick answer for you, which I wish we did, but I have, yeah, okay, but yeah so, unfortunately. So, so you think I should try to contact their support? 
I do. And see if you don't have anything. Yeah, because this sounds like there's some sort of buggy thing going on in the system. And honestly, it does sound like an authentication error. What is good about this show, though, is that when people call in and they have these issues, our other listeners hear Uh, about it. You may have some other people. Exactly. So maybe someone will reach out and let me know. Oh, yeah, I had because I have not had that issue. You know, if I had, then I would have probably submitted a support request myself. It's a little bit easier for me to do. And so, yeah, I apologize that um, I've not seen this personally, but um, hopefully we'll get an answer. And of course, All right. always Thank feel free you. to reach out in the future uh, if you do hear back from iAmazing with the solution, because we love to have answers on the show just yes, as much sure. as questions. All right. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And uh, you guys are or terrific. Uh, oh. When Leo was away, it was very nice, though. Isn't I he great? To say. Thank Isn't you he great? so much. He does a good job. Doesn't he? <laughs> Thank you, John. Yeah. Thank you, John. Absolutely. We appreciate Thanks you. A lot. John, I love you. Okay. We've talked. We've talked many times before, and you're. Uh, I. I just hats off to you. You. You, you're well, amazing. You. You're I doing really the dang it. thing. You're I amazing, say. as they would say. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hey, All thanks, right. John. Thanks a lot. Take care. We um, should explain what iMazing is. It's for iPhone users. Yes. It, it, is, a, it is our recommended tool for getting stuff off your iPhone. Basically. Absolutely. All sorts of stuff. And in fact, it is a tool used by many a, uh, what do they call them? Court researcher. For, uh, for forensics. forensics. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, you know, it was funny. Uh, I want to save a, uh, a long iMessages text thread. And I was looking, well, how do I, how can I do that? Does Apple have a way of printing out like the whole thing as a PDF? And in fact, they do, but that's crazy. And then I realized, oh, amazing. Mm-hmm. I can download the whole thing as text and have it, uh, you know, as a as a history. In fact, what we often are recommending iMazing to people who've lost loved ones who Absolutely. want to save text messages or voicemails. Uh, you know, and there really is no easy way to do that through I, Apple's own uh, facility. So iMazing is a great choice, Mac or PC, and it's for iPhones. Um, I'm showing it, but I guess, have you lost my, uh, oh, I-M-A-Z-I-N-G dot com. And they deserve a nice little plug because they've saved my bacon yes. many a time. Available on Windows and Yeah, I like Mac. that. That's nice too, yeah. Because you know what? I bet there are more Windows using iPhone users than there are Mac using iPhone users. Yeah. Do you think? Because there are more Windows, Windows users. users. <laughs> yeah. In general, as a result. Uh, let's take a little... What are, what are you doing? I don't know what we're doing. Oh, I have a phone caller lined up. Oh, well, let's talk to the phone caller lined up. Hello, phone caller Welcome lined up. Lined up. <laughs> What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Tim from Niagara Falls. Hi, Tim. Tim. What can we do hey, for you? welcome back, Leo. Thank you. I had a nice vacation, and it's always nice to know that I've left the uh, keys of the car to <laughs> a young person who is not going to drive it above the speed limit. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and, and and so I think Mike is always, uh, it's really nice to have Mike around as a backup, as, as it were. Yeah, we, yeah, he did a great job last week. So did um, Devendra Hardwar well, hosting never- Twit. He was wonderful. Yep, Jason Paris. Snell hosting Mac Break Weekly. Paris did her own This Week in Google for the first time which is great. So thanks to all of them. They did a great job. How can we help you, Tim? Yeah, I um, was uh, lucky enough finally to launch in on the um, AirPods Pro 2. Nice. Um, I've been with the noise canceling and it really changed my world. It's like yeah. literally like you're in a bathtub and you just sink below the water. <laughs> yeah, that's a good analogy. <laughs> that is a really good analogy. That's good. I like it. The words just disappears. I couldn't believe it. But um, I have a little trouble with them, and I hope it's not major. Um, I have Apple TV as well, and usually I did have Power Beats, and when I would turn on my Apple TV, it would see my Power Beats and say, you know, do you want to connect and hit the TV button? Uh-huh. And I do have the I do have the recognized AirPod setting on the Apple TV, but for some reason it doesn't see these. They literally have to go into settings each time to pair them. Okay. And uh, there's, that, there's that issue. And then I had one other question before I go. Yeah. Okay. So um, basically what you're saying is you've been used to where you put on those power beats and then up on the TV in the top right corner, you see the little banner that pops up and it says hit the TV button to connect these uh, power beats. You are not seeing that with your current AirPods, correct? Yeah, correct. And I've powered them both up and down and 
system, but check the settings. It does say, say it in there. Suggest nearby AirPods in the good, uh, good. menu in the control panel. Let's turn that on, but it, it's um, not doing it. The, so next, the next thing I would ask you is when you set up your power beats, uh, are you? Do you have the same iCloud account as you did when you set up the Power Beats? I do. Okay, um, I do. Correct. That's yeah. good to know. That that does make a difference. Um, I would s and and since you've gotten the AirPods, you said you tried again with the Power Beats, and they they popped up the banner. Yeah, they do. Okay. Um, I, yeah. Okay, so there are a couple of suggestions that I have for you here. Uh, the first suggestion that I have is to, if you haven't done this already, um, go into, and I know this is a pain, but go into your uh, Bluetooth settings on any of your devices that you've used with your AirPods. So your iPhone, if you've got one, your iPad, if you've got one, your Mac, if you've got one, go into the Bluetooth settings, hit the little eye icon and completely remove the AirPods entirely. And then also go to the Apple TV and make sure that they are not in the Bluetooth connection anymore. Uh, because iCloud is technically supposed to, when you do the removal on one device, it's supposed to sync across all of them, but sometimes it doesn't. And then here's a little thing that you have to do as well. Make sure you need to go into the Find My app on your iPhone or other device, and you need to go to... Uh, devices and you need to find your AirPods there as well and make sure that they are removed from there as well. Uh, you can, you, again, it's in the devices list. You tap on the AirPods and you choose remove this device. And once that's, once it's gone from all of those, then you take your AirPods Pro, you make sure they're both inside of the case, you flip the case open. And then you turn it around and you press and hold that button on the back. Uh, I think it's like for 10, 15 seconds, something like that, to completely factory reset them. And then go through the process of pairing them again. Only after you've made sure that it's true, they, it's truly been removed from all of the devices, then you pair them again. And then I suggest that on your Apple TV, the first thing you do is go into the Bluetooth settings and pair them that way. Uh, and then see if it works. Now, the reason why I'm saying all of this is because I had an issue where my AirTags were not working properly. And I came to find out that for some people, AirPods that were still stored in Find My, even if they were removed from Bluetooth, were causing some authentication errors with other Bluetooth devices. So, while it may seem like it's extra work that doesn't need to be done to also remove them from Find My or to make sure that they're gone from Find My, I'm telling you, you want to do that as well. So it's kind of a big old troubleshooting uh, nonsense, but uh, by doing all of that, I'm hoping that will jostle loose whatever is keeping them from appearing because, yeah, that's annoying that they're not showing up. Yeah, and once you get it working, it's pretty reliable, yes. right? Yeah, I mean, I've, I haven't had to do any of this. Yeah, I mine has worked nonstop. I don't know why you're having that issue. Um, you can always, if you haven't, I, this is why I didn't suggest this at first. I imagine you did this. Toggle off and on that setting that, that says suggest nearby AirPods. And also reboot your iPhone. Yeah, reboot the iPhone. That's, reboot the Apple TV. That should be done regularly. Apple TV needs yeah, to be rebooted that almost be weekly for me. It's very unreliable. So once you know how to get that, to then, the... Uh, that little utility screen where you can see them, right? You press the, t what is it, the top two buttons on your remote, and then it comes down and you can actually choose your AirPods there. Oh, it's yeah. kind of like the control yeah. center on your on your iPhone or your Mac. Um, so sure. you know that. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's all, that's, that's all great. It's going to be a little time consuming. And then I guess once I have uh, them paired, with the TV, and then I go to the other devices and reconnect them, including turn back 
Turn yeah, the it's kind of annoying. Yeah, course. but you have to uh, yeah, 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 yeah. start you over. Turn back. Yeah, you'll, um, I I would connect it before you connect it to the Apple TV. Go ahead and do it the normal way with the iPhone. You know how when you first got them and you flipped open the top and then the little thing popped up on your iPhone and it said connect these. Start there, sure. then do the Apple TV. In theory, the iPhone is supposed to tell all your other devices, yes. right? So you should only have to do that you should once. Only have to do it once. And the Apple TV goes, oh yeah, yes, my AirPods. Yes, okay. but again, it should do that. That's yeah. That's where there might be. Yeah. Errors. So, uh, yeah, that. I wear my. my I, I love your analogy. Of getting in the tub. I wear my uh, AirPods on the plane, and it's amazing. You put them in, and all that jet noise goes away. It doesn't fix the crying babies. It only <laughs> fixes continuous background. Yeah. Sound. If only babies all cried at the same frequency yeah. always. Yeah. But it does, but it makes a huge difference uh, in terms of flight fatigue if you spend time in the air. That's why you always see, you know, when Bose came out with their first noise canceling headphones. Everybody had them because it makes such a huge difference. I think uh, while Apple yeah, does Yeah, if I could ask you one more question. Sure. Of course. Yeah, I'm just um, using these. Um, I almost wish, and this is the feature they uh, first introduced, the short stems. I wish they were a little longer. I literally have trouble with the new controls, just finding the spot that you actually turn up the volume and up and down and using it correctly if you hold it with your thumb on one side and the thing on the other. And I end up, I sometimes end up just knocking them out of my ear when I try to use oh, it. Oh no. I think the um I think there's a special team at Apple that actually concentrates on making things more slippery and more hard to use. Yeah. Like, yeah. My friend Steve he's in and out of the case. My friend Steve it's Martin almost, said, almost, you know, I got the new iPhone and Wow, it's even slipperier before, than before <laughs> Ann made a glass. It's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. it's, I think it's the so like aesthetic of high it. tech. It's too many science fiction movies. Right? Yeah. What, yeah. so, so what's. Have you problem with air tags? You're putting the batteries and putting the batteries back in the air tags. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And you're trying to twist it. The, my recommendation there, yeah. they make rubber bands that are pretty thick. And I'll take oh, the rubber band okay. and put it between it. And then it's got grippy on one side and grippy on the other. And so I press it between my palms with the rubber band on either side. Yeah. And the rubber band helps to grip both sides of it and then undo it. Yeah, I've had that issue as well. I just replaced the batteries uh, in my air tag and my luggage before the trip. That's good that you did before the trip. Yeah. yeah, uh, um, yeah. I, as far as the air, the ears go, yeah, there, I don't have a easy solution for you there. There's probably some uh, person out there who'd be like, you know what you could do is you could, they make, could they use used a to make, Dremel on it and you could make it a little rougher or something. No, but, they used you know. to make little uh, uh, latex sleeves mm -hmm. that would go over the whole, you know, cause it's got a tip of yeah. course on the eye uh, and the AirPods, but they would go over the whole AirPod to make, but I don't know if you could still get those, but I remember we used to recommend those on Mac break weekly when they first, the first AirPods came out way back. Way back when, in the good old days. Yeah. Hey, great advice, guys. Hey, thank you. Yeah, thanks for calling in. Thanks for your questions, wanted, and we wish you yeah, luck. <laughs> just wanted to add. Just wanted to add. Um, happy uh, club to a member, and highly recommend it. There's oh, so much you guys offer for a little. You. Thank so, you so um, much. Coming forward. I thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you so much. Take care. Uh, here from Yahoo. Finance, actually from Lance Ulanov writing for Tech Ra Radar. He used to be the PC Magazine editor-in-chief. Good friend. He has an AirTag battery replacement trick. Let's see what he's got here. Uh, this is Apple's instructions. And you see how slippery it is. You press down with your thumb. And <laughs> you can't open the darn thing. Let me see what he recommends. He probably recommends your trick, which is the rubber band trick, right? I don't know. Let's see. He says... Uh, I found that opening air tags is a two-hand job. Oh, rest it across. He says, use both thumbs, but maybe he has sticky thumbs. <laughs> He's got those um, thumbs like the. This is of how a cat. actually. This is how I've opened them because they. It's it's important. It's good to know that you that it does twist yes, to open. Yes. Like at first you go, well, nothing's yeah, happening. Do I pry it? What do I do yeah. here? No, so it twists. So it twists to open. It's un, almost unscrews, and then you can replace it. I can't believe Lance got an entire article out of that tip. Yeah. Wow. That's like <laughs> that's so many so many paragraphs. So many paragraphs uh, on using his two thumbs to open his air tags. That's hysterical. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. What should we do now? What How about one last refreshing pause? One pause that refreshes. 
And then Patrick Delahanty and our engineer, uh, who is a brilliant man, says, I didn't even know people tried with one hand. Of course you use two thumbs. Two thumbs to open it. Yeah, of course you do. Of course that's what you do. Of course. But don't do it after you put on hand lotion. Okay? Save the corn huskers for after you change the battery. You're watching Ask the Tech Guys. That's Micah Sargent. And I know it's hard to tell us apart now that I have this deep tan. <laughs> I'm Leo Laporte. I did not set out to tan, by the way. No, good. I slathered myself in uh, sunscreen. Good. But you spend enough time out in the sun, even with sunscreen. You will get the tan. You get yeah. a little brown. Uh, 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 let's continue on. Uh, what, what do we got uh, here? Uh, I'm going to pick up on a phone call. There. I'm surprised nobody said anything about my shirt. I thought Leo, would, what's that shirt? I thought this would attract <laughs> some attention. Normally I wear a, oh, I was supposed to wear my seaweed sweater today. But I'll wear it next week. Got to wear this. Got my sweater. seaweed sweater. They say it's going to be a little tight when you get it. Oh. Just so it wear it. It will it will adjust to your ease body. Ease into it. It feels a little strange. Does it? Yeah, but not like seaweed. Just, does, it, does it feel like it's suctioning to you? Yeah. <laughs> or it's getting slimy? Yeah. <laughs> uh... Who? What? Hello. Let's call her right here. Hello, caller. Hello. Hey, what's your first name? What city are you calling from? Leo, you, you know who this is when I tell you. It's Mick the Wick. Hey, Mick the Wick from Athens, Ohio. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where we, we met the last time, Leo, was in Athens. Yep. You live I'm a little back, south I've of Athens. I've been following you ever since. Yeah. We call him yeah, Mick I'm the Wick. Yeah, I'm in so. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you? I'm in Senecaville, Ohio, by the lake. Senecaville, so we by met the lake. When you, yeah, you you came here to Athens, Ohio, Ohio University, and spoke at that symposium, what, 20 right. years ago, probably. God, it feels like a long time yeah. ago. Yeah, the Ohio State University. Uh, but yeah. Mick, we call him Mick the yeah. Wick because, do you still make candles? Oh, yeah, I still make candles. Yeah, I sure do. I, I have a house designated specifically for making candles. And <laughs> it's just, a house? It's a, yeah, it's a serious hobby. Well, houses are pretty cheap here in this part. They're Appalachia, so it's it's, it's pretty a cheap here in this area. Yeah, it's a but yeah, you and you uh, buy wax in the in like giant cubes. Uh, um, actually, yeah, yeah. Thirty years ago, I told my when I retired. I told my wife I'm going to make candles and give them away to people and see what happens. And she says, okay. And so I had this truck pull up. There was 18 tons of wax. <laughs> you really yeah, went all yeah, in. Yeah, you I'm just hot. said, yeah, I'm making yeah, candles. Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, you have a candle house. Day, yeah, you've got you a whole can take 18 house. tons yeah. of wax. Oh, my yeah. God. Now, where do you get the wicks? Oh, I I buy those from you know different outlets. You don't make your own wicks. Different places. Oh no, no, you could make them out of kite string, but the ones that you make are much better. So yeah, you know, and they they work a lot better. Yeah. Mick so, is a uh, dear dear friend. We did meet many moons ago. Probably yeah, you're right. At least twenty years ago, and uh, has been a friend ever since. And has given me so many great tips, and uh, yeah. and we I just uh, so many great candles. Or you know what? Have you ever sent me a candle, Mick? Actually, when you were in Athens, I gave you some, and I I asked you to give some to your wife and daughter and your Aww. mother, and they, they they were actually they were actually powder that I ground off a candle because I knew you were flying, and you know they like to cut into stuff when you get on the damn airplane. <laughs> I so, remember um, now. They were powder. Yeah. And you can, yeah, and you just stick the wax in the powder. Yeah, and you can just burn and make your own. That was so right cool. There. They were powder. I remember yeah. that now. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, that was a lot of years ago. That, and I sent you cheese just because I'm in Ohio. Every year I get a oh, big. Cheese. Remember, He's you've had his cheese guy. A big package uh, yeah. of cheese. Uh, yeah. Once he said it at the post office box, uh, yeah. and uh, <laughs> and <laughs> it was sat there for a little while. Ooh. But you know what, Mick? Most yeah. of that cheese yeah. was fine. I stayed away from the summer sausage, oh. but the cheese yeah. was fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, cheese ages well. Yeah, always a pleasure to talk to you. What's up, Mick? Yeah, let me let me tell you this. Lee. I never did tell you this, but. Back when you were a young pup and you were a DJ on the radio, you were, I'm not going to say Wolfman Jack, but you were kind of known as a 
as a wild broadcaster, keeping people awake in the middle of the night. And I had a buddy named the Mojo Man. And he broadcast in North Carolina, and he also broadcast the Woho up in Toledo. And he told me that he used to listen to your clips and he'd get some tips from you on how he could make his show even crazier. All right, baby, we got going to talk now about late night radio. Oh, I love it. Oh, I love it. Uh, yeah. You know. Yeah, his name. Go ahead. Mojo. Sid, he, he passed. He was from Florida when he retired. Oh. And he passed away a couple of years ago. But oh. he's uh, the Mojo man on YouTube. And he's got a, a air check on there. So oh, you the might Mojo hear man. some of your old stuff that. I'm going to yeah, check out the Mojo man. man. Awesome. Yeah, he was a buddy of mine back in the 50s and the 60s. And wow. uh, and he really enjoyed listening to your show. So, you know, wow. that, I know that takes you back a little bit. Oh, yeah. You know, it's when funny. Were, yeah. when, when I think about it, uh, you know, I fell in love with radio in the, in the 70s when I was in college and uh, pursued a radio career for almost 50 years, very close to 50 years. And... Uh, I kind of want to think about it. I kind of was at the presided over the decline and demise of radio. <laughs> it was it's yeah, kind yeah. of a dying medium uh, because it's been for the most part replaced by internet based audio, uh, whether it's speak spoken word or, or music. Most people that's how they listen uh, to the radio now. They listen to stuff they downloaded or they stream. Uh, but I love radio. I love the idea of uh, of talking to somebody miles away just threw a microphone in the air and it's kind of a magical magical medium i really love uh, and loved was very grateful for a career in radio it's so nice to hear from you mick yeah. i just really appreciate it yeah kind of a sad thing that we'll be losing am radio but that's yeah. the way technology goes well, it's the way it goes it is today and out in 50 years yeah. <laughs> it is kind of it's Here's kind my of question bad. yes sir i just got i just picked this up yesterday and i never heard of this I, on my phone, I got a message saying, if you want to know if the police are monitoring your cell phone, type in star pound two one pound. So I says, well, you know, I'll give it a shot and see what happens. So I did that and the phone number came up. And this is like three o'clock in the morning. I'm not sleeping. So <laughs> then I, I thought about it and I said, you know, I bet that's some <clears throat> person who wants to monitor my phone. Oh, well, it turns yeah. it on. Yeah, it turns it on and sends it to their number. Well, I'm not going to ask it you to repeat it because I was... Pound. Oh, go ahead. Star pound. Yeah. Wait a minute. Let me, tell, me, Star, tell me again. Star pound. Two one pound. Uh-huh. And then if now, I... I don't know if there's other codes for that. Wait, I'm going to see. Please, says, please now, wait. I... What, what kind of idiot am I? I'm doing it. Yeah, I don't know why you're doing it. But Setting interrogation okay. succeeded. USA Today in July of 2020. <laughs> Dialing this code does not show if your phone was tapped. Look at, can you see this over my shoulder, yeah. John Ashley? Yeah. <clears throat> it says, setting interrogation succeeded. Voice call forwarding on all <laughs> calls disabled. What the hell is that? And, and how did they do okay, it? Okay, now that... Now that you've punched that into your phone, it just shows okay, that there is a code you can punch in and turn that off. What's that code? I didn't know what that code is. You got to Google that. I forgot. What it was. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is Boy, how, Ayana. this is how people determine if call forwarding has been enabled on their device. That's and in what fact, the actual it's not, setting. It is not enabled on my device, yeah. and that's what it's saying. Thank yeah. you for googling yeah. that. I don't have to do anything more, no, right? No, I, because you don't have call forwarding. No. Jeez, Louise, you no. scared me. But uh, now I'm going to play for your benefit, <laughs> Barry Friedman. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Mojo Man. There you go. I like his hat. Did he always wear that? As long oh, as. Yeah. yeah, he always. Yep. Oh, my. From Shoes to out of play. Woo, every night, Saturday night, and every day Sunday, and all been wrong, but I want to do it one more time. Hi, I'm Debbie Evans, a wild lover. Yeah, that's what you say. Huh? All right, there. From WOHO Radio, Toledo, AM. This is from Christmas 1969. Late boys and girls, 
This is what radio used to sound like. Oh, decorates a bird phone time. Decorate or simulate a turkey's wishbone any manner you please. They're mailed to bring it to a hole or any of the Tom McCann shoe stores in the Toledo area. There, Betty Valley. That's an ad. It's moving yeah. so quickly. <laughs> Children today, you young people, Ooh, what are you couldn't even understand that, yeah, I like, bet. Are there subliminal messages being delivered at this moment? <laughs> yes. I, I, that's, I miss that more than anything, is that crazy, they used to call it boss jock radio, the great stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was a boss yeah, jock. Yeah, back in 1969, Mojo Man had on his radio on Woho. He says, all right, I'm sending this one out to Mick and Barbara here in Aww. Toledo. And the song is Bobby Hinton, I Love How You Love Me. Oh. And 50 years later, oh. I told him we got married just because he played that damn song. <laughs> oh, and, and how how and many years have you been married now? Oh, we've been, we've been married three happy years. Three? My wife wants to. Yeah, my wife wants to know what the hell three I'm talking about. But been over fifty. <laughs> Mick, you're the greatest. I get it. Three happy Mick, years. Mick, uh. three happy years out of the fifty. I get it. Now I get it. Uh, Mick, uh, we had a little medical scare a couple of years ago. We thought we were going to lose you. Uh, we all said goodbye in the chat. Uh, I talked to you, yeah. but you're still going strong, and I'm not surprised. You've got yeah. you got heart, man. You got a lot of spirit. It's great to talk yeah. to you. Thank you, Mick. Yeah. Thank you for all the years yeah. of entertainment you've given us. Thank you, Mick. You guys are you guys are a lot of fun, Micah. You're you're serving your public very very well. Thank we really you so appreciate much, Mick. Yeah. all you do, and yeah. of course you, you too, Leo. The doctors gave up on me like two years ago, and they said, "Good luck." And we're, the best we can do is give you a handicap parking sticker so you don't have to walk the damn <laughs> well, car. That was nice of them. Other than that. <laughs> Well, and, we're just so glad you're still with us. I, I have to say, we're just, we're just. I feel grateful for every extra year. Thank you, Mick. Yeah, the doctor said, doctor said, don't miss church on Sunday. You ain't gonna get it. It may not be so, a rerun. Okay, okay. Yeah, but you're we're enjoying man. your show and we love the Discord, and you guys are doing a wonderful love job. Love to you and, and Mrs. Thank Wick you. and everybody in Senecaville. Yeah. It's great to hear from you. May you have at least two <laughs> happy years. <laughs> <laughs> two more happy years of marriage. <laughs> Thank you. Take, Take care. Take care. Bye, bye. Oh, oh. <laughs> so nice to talk to him. I see somebody familiar in our. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of. I'm going to be a little biased here and kind of want to pick up. I mean, he's, they're kind of fussing around with their stuff, but uh, I'm, going to, a, I'm going to put him on, sp on the look, spot. He looks a little familiar. I don't know. I feel like maybe it's just the, it's the Clemson Tiger. Uh, it's some, it's his, some weird orange thing cap. where yeah, maybe that's, that's what it is. Let's see who's, who's going to show up in our, uh, in our magic. What do we call this? The Stargate. The Stargate. Oh my no. God. It's Aunt Pruitt as I live and breathe. Hello, Aunt. <laughs> Why, why is Mr. John A. giving me grief, man? Oh, we love That's you so job. much, and we miss you so much. Tell us what you've been up to. <laughs> uh, just just tinkering around and, and just doing the freelance life, enjoying it. And, and, you know, as I tell people, just going around trying to shake the money tree. <laughs> <laughs> well, how can we stuff. help you do that? Of course, go to your website, AuntPruitt.com. Great photography on sale there. You sent me a... <laughs> 1,000-piece jigsaw puzzle, yes, one of your best you got it. photos. Uh, 1,000 pieces, <laughs> Ant? You got? You think, I, yeah. you think I'm smarter than I am. <laughs> Come on. I, I think John have it together by now. Come on, man. <laughs> I have to say, I miss your push-ups uh, here in the uh, studio. Uh, yeah, the rest getting, of us can't oh, do quite as many. He was getting us all to do push-ups. You got to keep at it. You yeah. got to keep at it. I, I wanted to chime in because at me on the Logitech Mevo core cam and I was wanting to get your take and see how I look and how I sound. Well, I'll I'm tell you one thing, you you're getting the microphone, mic. you're using it as the microphone, aren't you? Right. Yeah. Right. So, and how does that sound to you? All? It's, it's, all like, it's um, for a zoom call to be fine. Yeah. It's, it's not as good as you have that great microphone in front of you and you know, you would sound better. In fact, it's so funny. Mm -hmm. We've trained the, the chat 
The Discord folks are all saying you're on the wrong ant, Mike. Yeah. You're on the Mark, no, Mark ant. You're on the wrong. They all know, but but he's doing it on purpose. I, but I have to say yeah, the I'm picture is the picture is fantastic. Yeah, it looks so crisp. I mean, and there's even some bouquet going on a little bit, which is nice. But yeah, as far as the sound, I would say eh, it's mm -hmm. it's giving uh, you know laptop microphone. Yeah, well, back to my, see to how much my better rate. he sounds on the good mic. Yeah, but the difference <laughs> is the reason is, is as you know, any any camera that's on your laptop is going to have to have an omnidirectional mic. It's at somewhat of a distance from you, omnidirectional, so it could pick you up no matter where you are in the room. And so you're going to get a lot of room tone. That's what we call yeah. it, that kind of echoey feeling. Uh, but that's that's to be expected. I'll be honest with you, I hear it on on nationwide news broadcasts it sometimes sounds like that if you watch does that not annoy you it yeah. annoys the crap out of me when i turn on, <laughs> turn on these so-called like, the professionals yeah. and their video and audio is craptastic i'm like come on i know your budget's way bigger than that yeah <laughs> they could sound this good but no they they, they wear these lav mics and then sometimes they put omnis on them because the, we used to do that too at tech tv because people will move their head and if it's a directional mic they, they move off like you can't mm -hmm. hear them they're over here and so yeah. you have to use an omni and then it's picking up everybody it's it's the worst on the panel shows like meet the press where everybody's yeah. got an omni on them and it just sounds terrible it sounds like they're oh, in a echo chamber so yeah but i didn't want to take up all your time i just I, I i was tinkering around in here in my studio and i said let me see how it sounds and 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 just sort of give team twit a hard time yeah. uh, i have that i have the camera plugged into the atm even though i don't necessarily have to do that oh um, interesting so just, as a, just as a comparison like this is my canon yes yeah, right now i think it looks as good as your Canon. i mean hold on wait a minute hold on this is this is the Mevo. Oh, oh you were on the, whole the time cannon. We were on the cannon. No wonder it looks so good. I was on so the cannon the whole time. There we go. But this that's is good. Amiibo. No, that's crisp. No, it's it's not, nice. Yeah. It's four K, right? It's pretty good, and yeah. I can tap and focus and all of that stuff, and really zoom out because it's got a micro four thirds sensor. It doesn't have wow. any tiny webcam. That's sensors, a huge sensor you know? for a webcam. So it's 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 better than I expected. M E V O um, so is that how they uh, spell it? Right, M E V O. I'm going to do a a first look and a review for it on ZDNet.com because I am now also freelance contributing with Mr. Yay. Jason Hunter at ZD. Nice. Uh, so they sent this to me like two days ago, and I hadn't had time to really. It spend is not time inexpensive. It's a four hundred dollar webcam. Wow. <laughs> they they must have bought there was a company called Mevo. In mm -hmm. fact, I have the original Mevo camera yep. for streaming to Facebook. They must have acquired them. That's correct, sir. That's correct. So one of the cool things about the original Mevo, it was a 4K camera that could pan and zoom without moving because it would do a 1080p signal out of that 4K. So it had a right. it had the ability to kind of follow you around and stuff. I still have that Mevo camera. Uh, this thing, it looks of, good. And and yeah, like I said, yeah. the wide shot, I don't really need this wide shot. Y'all don't need to see my whole dadgum space. <laughs> but that's but, the point is I they will, can they can zoom in on a little portion of it and give you some. And it still yeah. looks pretty it's good. It's like a PTZ, yeah. yeah. You know, and I did all of that just from my phone. I have to tell you, it's excellent at orange. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. It's like it was tuned for that. All, often the challenging. Balance, yeah, the the white balance on it was a little bit off. Um, that's probably got something to do with it too. So let me dial that back here. There we go. No, that's I think it looks good. Don't mess with it. It looks a little bit better. Okay, Anytime you I'm, want I'm to picky. test a camera, <laughs> you just call us. We'll be give glad to call. Give you the feedback, <laughs> and we'll look for that article on ZDNet.com. That's great. Yeah, hopefully we'll get that out this week. I'll start writing it tomorrow morning, and um, just as a first look, and then I'll do a, a straight up review review of it um nice. in a couple of weeks because i don't believe in just grabbing stuff and saying here's my review of it after two days yeah. that's bull crap you need to spend some time mm -hmm. i agree Steve. with you yeah. so, and uh you still sound as good as ever man you sound you keep that good microphone because you sound good, on you. You <laughs> sound so good. i miss you so much and we we miss love you, you so glad much to see you yeah and, and you. i'll make a comment about your avocado shirt i had avocados this morning so, <laughs> yay yeah, and we, we got go. john ashley 
Doing the push-ups. The push-ups. Here we go. The Aunt Pruitt Memorial right. push-ups. Yeah. Oh, wow. Get it done. He did about five and then collapsed. <laughs> he tried to do uh, the, the five more diamond than the next person did. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way Aunt started, right? You started with a few at a time and then you, you build up. a few up. at a time. Yeah, when he was still in the womb, he started with a few at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Aunt Pruitt. <laughs> Thank you, gents. Y'all so take great care. To Good to see you. you. Love Good to the family. Take care. Oh, Mr. Orange, Clemson fan for life. You can't, you can, you can take a guy out of the country, but you can't, can't take the Clemson out of the guy. That's for sure. <laughs> it's, that's, that's the phrase. So it sounds a little weird, doesn't it? Do we want to take one more? Yes. Apple color? Okay. I'm going to pick up on Brett. Brett, come on down. You're the next contestant on The Price is Right. Johnny Olson. One of the great announcers of all time. You know, the uh, the guy who does the announcing for uh, Jeopardy, Johnny Gilbert, 93. He's been doing it forever and ever, and he does it from his house. Really? Yeah, but they but there but there was just a documentary about him and uh, impressive guy. Let's play Jeopardy. I wish I could have gotten that gig. Hello. That'd be cool. Welcome. Where are you <clears throat> calling from? I'm calling from Seashelt, British Columbia. Beautiful. How's the weather it's, now in the Seashelt? It's uh, clear, sunny. We're out from the rain. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I live just down, the, well, not just down the street, but uh, uh, your Windows Weekly guy, uh, Richard, Richard Campbell um, is just down the road. Campbell. I know. Yeah. yeah. He lives up in uh, Madeira Park, Pender right. Harbor area. Right. So, uh, a beautiful area. So. Yeah. I thought I'd, I'd say seashell because everyone says it wrong when they see it spelled out. You're probably seeing it spelled. And you, everyone wants to say schluck, schluck, something. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember, she sells she sells in British Columbia. Much. Yeah. yeah. Um, so question. I, when explaining to family members uh, about VPNs and things like that, I find that I can do that pretty easily. But when I get the question about what exactly does my ISP see when I'm using um, something like the 1.1.1 uh, or 9.9.9, you know, an encrypted DNS uh, set up on your browser? What exactly does my ISP still see? Well, I know it's not a, a great VPN. question. Um, that's right. a wonderful question. So, you know, I'm going to have to explain how the Internet works. How much time do we have? Yeah. Uh, as you probably, <laughs> no, 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 this is great. As you, I'm sure know, uh, when you enter in a web address like yahoo.com, you're not entering, you don't, your browser doesn't know what to do with that. It first has to find out what the phone number is. Same way. If I want to call Micah, I can't just say call Micah. Sorry. Well, I can nowadays, but it would look up a phone number, right? right? So we don't have phone numbers on the internet. We have IP addresses, internet protocol addresses, but it's pretty much the same idea. This dotted quad, you know, the 192 dot, 168 dot, 1 dot, 1. That's the address. Every single computer on the internet, every single server is supposed to have a unique one. Now, that's a problem because there aren't enough addresses to go around. So when you're in, and that's one of the reasons you have to use a router, you have a unique IP address uh, assigned to you by your internet service provider. But inside your network you might have multiple devices they all have local addresses but they all emerge onto the internet with that one ip address provided by your internet service provider they do the phone number lookup through something called a dns server or domain name system server it's the big phone book uh, the uh, the actual phone books are 13 canonical they call them servers all around the world that contain the canonical a, a address matching with the websites that's managed by a, a non-governmental organization. It used to be the U S but it's now an uh, international body called ICANN, the internet corporation for assigned names and numbers. So when you go out and buy a domain name, you're buying it from a registrar who is chartered by ICANN to sell them. You say, I want uh, Leo.com. And they say, okay, that'll be nine ninety five, And then they send the information up to those 13 servers. You're now in the big phone book in the sky. And every d domain name server will eventually get a copy of, partial copy of that, so that when you type in leo.com on your browser, it can find that one 
32.7.5.2.1, whatever that unique address is. So that kind of in a nutshell is how it works. When you're using 1.1.1.1 or 9.9.9.9 or my preferred uh, DNS server, a next DNS or open DNS or we can go on and on, other companies' DNSs, you have to use some domain name server. Sometimes people run their own. Most of the time, people use the one provided by the internet service provider. Oh, and there's where the privacy issue comes in. When you log, you know, onto a website, you're sending the name of that website to the domain name server that the internet service provider runs. They go, oh, he's going off to yahoo.com. Got it. And then they send the your browser that number. You never see this, but just the browser the number. The browser then contacts the outside world. So instead of asking the phone book owned by the ISP, you're asking a phone book owned by another group like Quad9 or 1.1, which is Cloudflare or uh, you know, 8888, which is Google or Verizon, I can't remember, or, or NextDNS, somebody else's. They get the same information your ISP would get. Now, the traffic still has to come through the ISP. So the ISP, it depends. Most servers, most servers now are encrypted. They're HTTPS. So the ISP won't see anything on an encrypted transaction. They won't, now they don't, no, no longer, not, not only don't see what you're saying, they don't even see the address. I, I don't think that's a good that's question. That's what I was wondering. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So what happens is you go out, you say, uh, I'm going to yahoo.com. Okay, this is the number. You then go to yahoo.com's number and you establish an encrypted communication with them. Yeah, your ISP doesn't see anything of that. So that's the point. Uh, there are all other benefits. Quad9, for instance, protects you with ad blocking and malware blocking and stuff because it basically says, well, you can't go to that site. Nope, not going to let you go there. So it 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 uses a blacklist to keep you from going to bad sites. It's because it's seeing all that and it can block that. That's all it's doing, really. Um, no, I don't know the ISP. I have to think about this, but the ISP once you if you're, it's unencrypted, they see it all. But most everybody's encrypted now with HTTPS. They're using uh, SSL to to talk back and forth or TLS now to talk back and forth. No, I don't think they see anything. I don't think they know who you're having a conversation with. You're saying if question. you're using a VPN. If you're not a VPN. So you're saying without a VPN, they still wouldn't see yeah, the Yeah, so, so here's the only way they were seeing before is you were contacting their phone book. Oh, because you were using their DNS. And right. when you contacted their phone book, they said, oh, Leo's going to Yahoo. But right. because you're not using their DNS, they know you're talking to Quad9. Do they know that? <laughs> um... Because it's encrypted. I, I, I don't I think so. Know. Yeah, I'll have to ask Steve. This is a good one for Steve. Uh, he's the expert on uh, infrastructure, uh, internet infrastructure. It is. Let me look and see. Maybe somebody in the Discord has a better uh, sense of this. But my sense of it is because nowadays, and this is why Google pushed this, we're using an encrypted communications medium with all of the servers. None of that's available to the ISP. Is the real question is, do they see? Yes, they do. You know what? I take it back. They have to. So when you're sending a packet, it still goes through the ISP. The ISP, if they're inspecting those packets, will see the address that it's heading to. Mm -hmm. They'll have to. And so, so they just don't do the lookup. You're, but they're not doing the lookup, but they're not, but they're going to see the, uh, the IP address of the packet because they have to, they have to route it. Right. So by using a VPN, VPN you're routing that. it all to one right. IP right. that right. is, or you know, one place, right. and then it's taking care of it on the other end. Yeah. So then, yeah, your old, your ISP is just going to see you connecting to that same uh, IP over and over and over again. So this was the problem I was having explaining to family members because we would go back and forth. Well, then why would I need a VPN? Because all every site I go to is now encrypted with HTTPS. And then the, the if I'm doing one dot one dot one, one, one do a good DNS reason. lookup, yeah. if my ISP doesn't see that I'm requesting a lookup, I mean, then why do they need a VPN? Then I tell them, well, but that's where I was confused. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a little conceptual. They have right? to because the packet, as you're com you're you're having an encrypted conversation with the other server, but they have to route it. 
And on the packet of data that you're sending out, even though that packet is encrypted, there is a little attachment that says, oh, this is going to 162. Because they got to know where to send so, it. Yeah, they got to know the phone number. So, yeah, they do see that. Now, there, there are other things that you can do. Paul Gregg in our Discord says if they're using split tunnel, then they wouldn't. But almost always uh, right. they're seeing it. Uh, your ISP knows even more if you use their DNS, mm -hmm. but it's not like right. they're completely out of the picture unless you use a VPN. So using an encrypted DNS service like 9.9.9.9, .9 .9 .9, um, the, I just, I don't, now I don't see the advantage of it because they can still, yeah, I'm doing an encrypted lookup with, you know, quad nine, but right. my ISP then still gets sent back. We'll, right. keep, we'll take, take Brett there now. Right. And yeah, it's like, and they well, can, and the they point? can, yeah, they can look up what that IP address goes to. The reason that I've yeah. done DNS in the past uh, specifically was because the built-in DNS from my provider at the time was so stinking slow, and yeah. so that's why I made the switch to, uh, right. you know, a different DNS in the first place. Then and the also, ad blocking services, yes, and then you have the benefit of ad blocking and the other things that right. you're able to do, like what Leo does right. with Next DNS. Um, I never saw it first and foremost as a privacy addition anyway um so but i could understand how someone would maybe think that that was the case and yeah, yeah there's, there's got to be something going very on. very much a difference between a vpn which does hide every all your traffic including who you're talking to from the isp and a third-party dns server there are still many many advantages to a third-party dns server speed of course but also it can do some blocking and other security stuff right I just remember the story of them, uh, the ISP providers in the UK complaining, you know, crying, they, you know, because everyone was starting to use. Uh, uh, yes, uh, there is one side effect; it turns that. you sideways. But other than that, <laughs> no, I do remember that. Go. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't like that, did they? Um, and I, I think that's a good point. Maybe they were, maybe they were crying crocodile tears maybe they're oh, maybe they were uh, saying oh we can't see Ooh. anything yeah all right yeah yeah they have to see it now that i think about it otherwise they wouldn't know where to send those, <laughs> just those be going, what, are we doing what are you gonna do with this <laughs> right somebody That's what i thought too and it's great question, we've always though. said this uh, about vpns is is that you're just kicking the privacy can down the road because the vpn right. says the same thing an isp sees it's going to see everywhere you're not the contents, but just where you're who you're talking to. Yeah. But as you know, often who you're talking to is as valuable as what you're saying to them, mm -hmm. right? Right. And and lastly, does my ISP know that I'm using a VPN in the first place? Yes. And they know they would. Okay. Especially be, depending on your VPN, how often they're switching out their IP address, um, and I mean, yeah, just just by default, they they just know because they can't see. Yeah, uh, right. They're not. They, you <laughs> if know, you're going to that same IP over and over and over again. They're not able to see anything else. They don't, they don't see anything. They just know. Well, he's right. having a conversation with somebody. We uh, we know who it right. is, right? Because we have to route that packet, but we don't know what's going on there. Yeah. Right. No, I, I mean, I, I don't live my life on a VPN, but because living in Canada and I use a lot of services in the U.S., oh, yeah. a lot of times I need to have a U, U.S. Yeah. IP address. I'm originally from Seattle and I moved up here in, in nice. 27. They call it the Sunshine Coast, but uh, is, yes. that, is that really? Uh... <laughs> it's more of, uh, it doesn't have as much. We're in the rain shadow from Vancouver Island, the so we're quite shadow. dry. Oh, good. So it is the Sunshine Coast. Good. Yes. Uh, it's more of, we don't get the rain, but it'll still be overcast. Yeah. Well, that's what I see. That's the, <laughs> the puzzle. overcast coast. <laughs> see, yeah, that, that doesn't have the same ring to no, it, does it? Doesn't. It, it kind of, no, no. It, it doesn't rain. In the throat. <laughs> what do you want? Hey, it's great uh, to talk get, to you. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. Well, thanks. Thanks for that. A really good question. Yeah, I had to actually question. had to think about it, it a little a thinker. bit. Yep. It's a good one. I appreciate it. <laughs> all right. Have a very great good. day in Seashelt. Now I know how to say it. Yes. Seashelt. Seashelt. You're right. When I look at the spelling, it looks like Sachel. Sachel. Yep. Bless you. Yep. I get that at the art fairs I go to. I'm selling my work. <laughs> they always say it incorrectly. It's derived <laughs> from the name of the uh, the First Nations people who settled there gave it, which was, I can't pronounce that either, Shashashanahelm, something like that. Seychelles, I believe. Seychelles. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's a, a beautiful name, actually. I like it. 
Yeah. Uh, where uh, the proper, uh, the land that the city, the downtown core is on, it's only a kil- kilometer wide. So there's water on both sides. It's an is- Ooh, isthmus. It's an isthmus. Now you say isthmus. that three times it's fast. Isthmus. Yes. It's an isthmus. <laughs> Mary Very isthmus. nice. <laughs> hey, great to talk to you. Thanks for, you're our last call of the day. We appreciate it. Very good. Nice Excellent. to end on a Have high a note. Day. I'll Take be listening care. to Twit. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, going to be a big one. We've got uh, lots to talk about. And uh, Kathy Gellis will join us, uh, our, our our resident attorney, to talk about it. So will Brianna Wu. That's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, I know his I know his name, but I can't pronounce it. Yeah, but I, is is that how you say it? Pagaro? Rob Pagaro will be here. No one knows how to pronounce it. Rob actually has on his website a video that tells you how to pronounce his name. <laughs> Rob Pagaro is Rob in studio, and Kathy's here too. Wow, we're going to have some fun. We better get going here. You've been watching the best darn podcast in the world. Woo! Ask the Tech Guys with Micah Sargent and Leo Laporte. We do the show Sundays, 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern time, 11 to uh, eleven to 2 p.m. Uh, West Coast time. Uh, because we are now on sun summertime, thank goodness, finally, goodness on Daylight Saving Time, uh, you will be able to start watching us at 1800 UTC. And where do you watch us? On YouTube, youtube.com slash twit. We stream all of our shows uh, in studio now, but just on YouTube. Uh, unless you're a Club Twit member, then you can also watch us in Discord. If you're not a Club Twit member, don't forget, twit.tv slash Club Twit. Very important to us. Uh, that that really makes a big difference uh, in terms of what we can and cannot uh, do. After the fact, on-demand versions of the show available at the old site, techguylabs.com, which turns out to be the news site, twit.tv slash ATG. You can also subscribe to Ask the Tech Guys anywhere finer podcasts are stored and distributed using the resources of the worldwide <laughs> internet. Are we, uh, anything you want to say? Just get in touch with us. Call twit.tv during the show, 888-724-2884 during the week to leave a voicemail, atg at twit.tv, the email that you can send text, voice, and video to. Yeah, send us a video. Yeah, well, that'd be fun at atg.twit.tv. Micah will be back on Tuesday for iOS Today, on Thursday for Tech News Weekly, and of course every Sunday right here. Right here. And uh, you know where to find me. Thanks for being here. Thanks to John Ashley, our producer. Burke McQuinn, our studio manager today. John's got the week off. John Slanina. Uh, we will see you next time on Ask the Tech Guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.